We're at the appointed hour, so if everybody will take their places. Welcome to the Regional Council meeting of Thursday, June 27th, 2019, and I will begin with roll call. All members of council are present except Mayor Crombie, who is on other municipal business. Mayor, sorry, Councillor Groves just walked in. Councillor Parrish, who is away on illness. Councillor Sato, who is away on illness. And all other members are present. Declarations of conflict of interest. Are there any? Seeing none. Approval of the minutes. I have a motion from Councillors Mahoney and McFadden that the minutes of the June 13, 2019 Regional Council meeting be approved. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Approval of the agenda. All those, uh, I move by Councillor Kovac, seconded by Councillor Innes. All those in favor? That is carried. Public announcements sponsored by a member of council. Seeing none. Consent agenda. So going past our delegations, first item with regards to item nine, um, items related to public works. Do I have consent for item 9.1? Consent item 9.2, item 9.3, item 9. Point, sorry, hold item 9.3, Councillor Groves. Yes. Very good. Yes. Item 9.4, consent. Communications items 10.1, 10.2, 10 uh, sorry, and the related item is item 10.1, is that correct? Yes, two. And two. And they will be held in conjunction with the other. Yes. Yes. Okay. Those are on uh, to be held. Moving on to 11, items related to health. Item 11.1. Hold that to be held. Item 11.2. On consent. Item 11.3. Yes. So to be held. Item 11.4. On consent. Item 11.5. Oh, actually, do we need a present and motions on those as well? Okay, so I believe that, just to be clear, 11, 3, 4, and 5 require action on our part on those. They can still do by consent. Oh, they can still be done by consent. What is the wish of count? The clerk advises they can still be done on consent, so I will run over them one more time. 11.3 on consent or to be held? That one's held. Held. Item on 11.4, to be held? to be held according to Councillor Raz. Item 11.5, on consent. Communications, I, uh, sorry, items, no communications items, items related to human services. Item 13.1, on consent. Items 16, no, communication item 16.1, on consent. Item 17.1, with requ the request for the development charges relief, the Church of Archangel Michael and St. Tecla. Hold that to be held. Um, in fact, what we might do, Mayor Brown, is given that you've asked for it to be held, and I see there's a delegation here, I may move that up as part of the delegation to get our good friends on their way once it's been dealt with. Very good. So that is on uh, to be held. Item 17.2, on consent. Item 18.1, consent. Item 18.2. On consent, uh, item takes us to notices, a motion that we will deal with at the time. Uh, with regards to the bylaws, I'll go to the in-camera. Does anybody have a reason to hold the in-camera item 22.1? Seeing none, that deals with the in-camera. So I now need a motion um, on behalf of the consent agenda, and I need a show of hands. No, a record of what my apologies. Um, and it has been moved by Councillors Groves and Councillors Fortini on the consent agenda. Please press your button accordingly to vote on our consent agenda. And that carries well done. So with that, we're on item seven, delegation 7.1. Deborah Martin Downs, Chief Administrative Officer, CAO, and Jeff Payne, Deputy CEO and Director, Corporate Services, Credit Valley Conservation, reporting to the Regional Council on the 2019 budget highlights and 2020 budget risks and service levels. Welcome.
Well, good morning, Chair Anika and members of council. And it seems like it was just a couple of months since we were here. And I don't know, other than this past week, it wasn't, it's just been about as cold as it was when we were here last time, I think. So, uh, uh, you know, Jeff Payne, he's here to uh, support me and, uh, and we'll get right into our presentation. So we're going to talk uh, briefly about uh, the alignment of what we're doing with your term of council priorities, uh, how we have a number of program updates for you and, and for 2018 and some of 19. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the 2020 budget and of course we never want to take an opportunity to miss talking to you about our budget pressures. Uh, so during this uh, term of council, we were pleased to see that you have built environmental resilience as one of your, uh, your term of council priorities. And I think uh, it's uh, important to say that CBC remains uh, an active partner with the region in helping you to deliver on this, uh, this uh, uh, goal that you have. And uh, it's our uh, uh, challenge as well to work with you on the Peel Climate Change Strategy and, and other uh, important initiatives that you have to, uh, to support this work. So as we do every June, we provide a summary of our programs and services and how much uh, we, what the activities are that we do, the outputs that we have uh, done over the year and what outcomes they support. Uh, you will be happy to know I do not intend to go through any of these, slide, these particular slides in detail. Uh, you can read the information that's provided. Uh, but in, the, in this uh, pod is the general levy projects that you support, and that uh, includes projects and services that are keeping development away from <clears throat> flood prone areas and natural hazards. Uh, we manage um, uh, natural resources on a watershed basis, and we are protecting public lands through this, uh, this amount of, of funding. We have a couple of good news stories we'll share for each of the buckets, and, and this uh, uh, story is, uh, was quite a spring with the uh, prolonged period of watching ice jams, which is kind of like watching paint dry until they start to move, and then that's rather, rather exciting. So we had three ice jams that we had to monitor in Ferndale and Caledon and Glen Williams <clears throat> in Georgetown and Meadowvale in Mississauga, and this picture here is looking out of my window at the office, so I, uh, I could keep an eye on it for, for staff. I, in Glen Williams, they had to resort to dynamite for the first time in, 20, in, in 40 years uh, to break up the ice jams before it uh, contributed to significant flooding. Uh, so the good news, though, that you might say, how is this good news? But the good news is the ice jam broke up uh, very uh, uh, uneventfully and uh, really did not contribute to any major damage and major flooding. So uh, in 2019, we had exactly the same thing happen here in Meadowvale, and there was quite a substantial amount of flooding uh, that went through the village of Meadowvale. So we were fortunate that it didn't happen two years in a row. Uh, last year, uh, Credit Valley Conservation began uh, managing the Cheltenham Badlands uh, under agreement with the Ontario Heritage Trust. We took the site on a trial run at the height of the uh, fall colors season up in, uh, in, in, in this area. Uh, so it was a bit of a challenge for staff, but they handled it beautifully. We uh, managed about 15,000 people through uh, about six weeks in the, on the site, operated the parking lot for the first time that uh, Peel built uh, a couple of years ago, and, uh, and it seemed to move very successfully. We opened early this year uh, in, uh, at uh, Easter. Uh, with anticipation that if it was a nice weekend, people were going to be wanting to come out, and they did. And so the site is in full swing now. We are providing a shuttle bus service between Terracotta and the, uh, uh, and the site so that uh, we can minimize the impact of the parking lot. And uh, we're seeing a slow change in behavior. So the bus is fuller than it was, and people seem to be getting the message that, uh, that you can do that. And then we also drive them also to Terracotta as well so they can enjoy that conservation area. So the feedback so far seems to be reasonably positive that we are managing the site well and that it's uh, reduced the impact on the community. Uh, and we'll continue to monitor that as we, as we run it through a full year uh, starting <clears throat> this year. So this uh, slide outlines the work we complete with our watershed projects uh, funding. And much of this work is focused on understanding our watershed environment through inventory and monitoring data, uh, forestry operations, restoration work as well. 
Um, and we, we believe that you can't uh, manage what is not measured. So we are in, in, intend to continue to do that, but, um, but some of these kinds of projects are at risk with the changes to the CA Act that the province has uh, created uh, in the last uh, month or so. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but, uh, but these are <coughs> important activities to continue to be able to do. We're very fortunate in the Credit River that we have a species called brook trout, and that species relies on very cold water uh, for its survival. Brook trout are kind of like our canary in the coal mine in, in the Credit, and if we have truly quality cold water systems, then the brook trout can thrive. In some of our areas of the watershed, brook trout populations seem to be declining, or they've been eliminated from areas due to past land use practices. And this site is in our upper credit conservation area. And the picture on the, that the fellow's holding up is what the site looked like uh, in uh, about five, five or 10 years ago. And what it looks like today is in behind him. The projects, uh, we've started a project called Bring Back the Brookies, and it started about five years ago, and it is trying to remediate the damage from cattle access in the Credit River. So we've had hundreds of volunteers uh, engaged through volunteer work days, uh, including uh, our own uh, board chair, Ms. Raz, uh, out in her waders, restoring the sides of the banks with uh, Christmas trees that have been collected and are used to capture sediment and create new banks along the shoreline. And she was joined by Loblaws and, uh, and World Wildlife Fund in the, in the endeavor. When we first started, that channel was 22 meters wide, and now it's about 10 meters wide. And so that means that the water can, be, can flow faster, and the, it's deeper, and it can be cooled. Uh, it will be cooler. Uh, eventually, there will be more trees growing up along the banks and more shade to the stream, which is still not uh, sufficiently done at this point. But there's a lot of work yet to be done, but it's, it's really heading us in the right direction to bring brookies back here. <clears throat> so this slide outlines the substantial and imperative work we're doing under the Appeal Climate Change Funding. There are three pots under the account, and that we've rolled up into one here, and the uh, includes water management work, natural heritage work, and education or sustainability work as well. Um, this work really accelerates much of the work we already do, so more tree planting, more low-impact development work. Um, so we're not, uh, we're not duplicating as much as just uh, accelerating the activities. So we're planting more trees, we're getting more stormwater management in the ground, we're engaging more landowners to take action in their urban and rural properties, and developing new tools to help us all adapt to climate change. So without these programs and services, we will not be as resilient to the change before us, and there's still a lot to do. <clears throat> One of the programs we are accelerating is the Fletcher's Creek Sustainable Neighborhood Action Plan, uh, and that follows the model that was developed first by TRCA. So we're pleased to say that the action plan uh, for the area was endorsed by CBC Board of Directors in March and Brampton Council in April. So we're continuing to work with the partners, the steering committee, and CBC staff teams to develop an implementation strategy that will bring the action plan to life. You can see by the turnout in the pictures on the right that uh, we've had record-breaking attendance at our, at our events. We've had 95 volunteers cleaning up Chris Gibson Park in April, over 100 residents from the neighborhood across Brampton seeking, attending a Your Green Yard workshop, and we're currently seeking funding from Federation of Canadian Municipalities for design and construction of the Hager Avenue Low Impact Development Retrofit Project. And I'm pleased to report that the Glendale School Rain Garden contract has been let to start construction in July, so while the <coughs> school is closed. Uh, there will be an official uh, launch of the action plan and a planting event in October, so Brampton councillors take note and you'll be invited to do that. And of course, everyone's welcome to come. <coughs> Peel's committed to incorporating low-impact uh, stormwater management measures on many of its roads, and CBC has been assisting the region in monitoring the uh, pr performance of those installations. Mississauga Road, which is pictured here, was constructed in 2018, and monitoring was established the same year. So the target for the site is a treatment of 90% of the stormwater, uh, that, uh, of 25 millimeters or less, and, uh, and that it improves the street aesthetics and it also uh, reduces the need for maintenance by watering. 
So while it's early days and staff were very careful that I couldn't step too far into uh, making pronounce pronouncements about, uh, about its performance, but, uh, but the in early indications suggest that it's working as it was designed to and it's filtering uh, and storing stormwater to delay peak flows and increase, improve the water quality and that will protect uh, a downstream habitat for red side dace, which is an endangered species. <clears throat> And our final category is the infrastructure projects, which supports our conservation area facilities, information technology, and information management in the office, flood risk mapping, as well as major maintenance to dams. So our conservation areas continue to see more people as the population grows in and around the watershed. We too need to be resilient and reduce our impact on the communities that we serve, as well as providing for great outdoor experiences. So we completed a conservation areas master plan uh, this, this past year to guide the work that needs to be done to modernize our parks and their offerings. And uh, in 2018, after four years of work, Credit Valley managed to receive board approval for the Bell Fountain Conservation Area Management Plan, and in January, the endorsement of the Niagara Scarpment Commission for that plan. And we're just waiting on Ministry of Natural Resources to finalize uh, the approval for the whole plan. So that plan sets a direction for perhaps the next century, but for certain the next 25 years of that, of that park. And it will preserve the cultural heritage of the park and give it a much needed facelift and add new infrastructure uh, to support future uses on the site. And one of the uh, planned uh, in infrastructure additions is to put washrooms right by the uh, main road so that uh, the regular general public can use those washrooms for the village because there isn't any facilities in the, in the village. So the outcome of our work is, is an ambitious eight to $10 million uh, plan to restore the site and to build a visitor center. Uh, it is, uh, it is, has really um, been well embraced by our approvals agencies and by, uh, by the community even. So we're, uh, we're hoping that it will transform the CA in a matter that will conserve history, uh, its place and the environment at the same time. In 2017, uh, Peel had supported us with a, a, a contribution towards our Warwick Conservation uh, Center to allow us to finish the expansion of our nursery building and office space. And I'm pleased to announce that we cut that ribbon uh, two weeks ago at our board meeting. So the Warwick Conservation Center is now the central hub for our nursery and tree planting operations, forestry, invasive species, landowner outreach, and other programs. So it, Currently, it'll now seamlessly connect the office and workshop spaces and provide operational efficiencies and outputs. Staff were, uh, were supported in three trailers on the site, so they're, they are so excited to be able to not have to go out in the middle of winter to the washroom in the other building. So, uh, uh, so thank you for your support for that. So the office space is about 8,200 square feet, and it will house about uh, up to 35 staff at times, and uh, because we have a lot of seasonal staff going through. It also has a multi-purpose uh, meeting room, lunch room, with a capacity for about 50 people. So we uh, intend to use that both for internal purposes and eventually be able to offer it to the community for community activities as well. So, uh, so that will be useful. So uh, we've also been asked to prepare uh, our preliminary budget slides. Um, we will say that there, this is not one of the slides that you guys asked for. We've, we've created this one uh, separately, and the slides that uh, the financial people were looking for are at the end of the, of the presentation, and I don't intend to go through those in any detail. Uh, we are still working through our 2020 budget. Uh, as you can imagine, as you have, we've had some in-year changes. We have changes that we're not certain about what is going to happen in 2020 for us and beyond with the changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. So we're still, uh, we're still mulling over all those things. The first call in the 2020 forecast was as we presented it in January to you last, uh, just this past year, as what we, our forecast was going to be for 2020, and that was uh, roughly a 7.2% increase. We have been working, as I said, on the 2020 budget. We are now at 3.99, but we are not completed yet, so we have a number of things that we can still look at to bring it down closer to your target. Uh, which is about uh, point, uh, your target for us is 3.4%, so we had need about another 0.5% or about $200,000 off that target. 
The next column is that uh, the province in uh, just the day after the budget was released in April cut our transfer payment approximately in half. Uh, so we were at $185,195. We are now at uh, $95,606.17 that they're going to give us. Uh, and that impact for Peel is about $82,000 when you apportion it for the, in the uh, adjustment, the levy adjustment. So this then drives, if we, if we just add that transfer payment requirement back, or the, the dollars back into the budget, that drives us back up to about 4.3%. So as I said, we're still in the process of, of uh, monitoring and figuring out what we can do to further adjust those numbers down. The transfer payment money that they gave us was for our hazard function, which is the function that they say we should be doing more of, which was kind of ironic in that sense. But, uh, um, but I don't anticipate there's going to be any additional uh, or restoration of, the, of that fund, but, but nothing will surprise me anymore. Uh, and then for the final column is a future forecast. And uh, well, right now we anticipate that the changes that came from the act will not impact us until the 2022 budget. Uh, that isn't certain. And so we're, we're, we said it's really to project a future forecast at this point is I think not, not particularly meaningful. Uh, so this just, uh, it was a slide that just summarized the, uh, the summary I've just got, given you. Um, as a result of the, uh, the changes in that, uh, that slide. Um, so I know the next few years are going to be tumultuous and that we're not going to know whether we have money, um, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have less money than we had, and I know you're, you're faced with those challenges as well. Uh, but we want to continue to tell, us about tell you about projects that we are pursuing and that we've invested a lot of money in, in pursuing this project that uh, would be such a waste if we could not take it to completion. Uh, because four years of staff time and, and significant cost for consultants and out to get us to this point of, of basically the concept approval. Uh, so we need to, we'd like to move on to detailed design on it. Uh, so we did get uh, the approval for the Bell Fountain a channel and dam project, and so we're just in the process of finalizing the detailed design for it and getting the final approval so that we can move to construction. And then this is the, uh, the top picture is the conceptual design for the visitor center at Bell Fountain, which uh, we think will be a marvelous space to have, and it will certainly animate and support the, the future uses at the site. And of course, the Credit Valley Trail, we continue to develop it. We've worked with all your uh, municipalities to and, uh, create a, a preferred route for the trail, and we'll be working it into both official plans and into, uh, into your uh, parks departments and what they can do to assist. Uh, we're pursuing uh, capital um, uh, land uh, acquisition for our first our first uh, um, acquisition specifically for the trail. We, uh, we've got about another $250,000 to go on, on fundraising for that. Um, both the Credit Valley Trail and Bell Fountain are being currently assessed for philanthropic interests uh, from the outside, because we recognize that public money alone is not going to support this. So, so we are looking at that. Um, and I also keep it on your radar if other uh, uh, grants or opportunities come through but different levels of government for uh, public recreation infrastructure that, uh, that we would uh, give us the heads up and uh, we're, we're also keeping an eye for that. But, um so these uh, slides are also part of your package. This is the climate risk methodology and how our, our climate change projects line up with that climate, uh, climate risk methodology. I don't intend to go through it in any detail, but I'd be happy to answer questions on it. And then these slides were the financial slides that were requested. And I won't spend any time chatting with those because they're really out of date as we stand. Uh, so um, thank you for uh, having us here again, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Deb, thank you very much, and there are questions. My first questioner is Chair of the Conservation Authority, Councillor Rass. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, thank you to Deb and Jeff for coming today. And I think I have more commentary than questions. Uh, but going through some of these legislative changes and, and uh, uh, reductions that we've experienced in the last few months, 
the, the challenges, and I'm glad you put the question marks in for 2021. We simply just don't know what's going to be happening. And that uncertainty is a problem for our operations. It's a problem for staffing. It doesn't do anything for morale. Um, but beyond that, when uh, the government is suggesting you're going to have a core group of uh, activities that you, you have to do that will be funded by the, the municipal tax levy, levy, and then a whole host of other things that I think are probably the most value added to community in terms of uh, education, tree planting, and some of those other things that other organizations are not doing, um, it poses a huge challenge. And um, municipalities are going to have to enter into uh, uh, memorandums of understanding with the CBC uh, to determine which programs they want to fund. So, for example, the SNAP program, would that be, would that come uh, in a mandatory program or would that be outside of that bucket? We expect it will be outside of the bucket. Uh, I think that they will try and scope the hazard bucket fairly narrowly um, to be things that can be directly attributed or drawn back to um, to the hazard management function directly. So, um, a lot of what one of the things that we've advocated through the process of the act was to include management of the watershed as a, a mandatory. Uh, activity because it, it was the original uh, mandate of the Conservation Authority and people suggest that hazards is our only mandate and that's not true. Ma managing the watershed has always been the mandate and we have made it, tried to make it quite clear to the province that you can't manage the hazard if you let the watershed go crazy. Uh, so we can stand back and watch the hazard get bigger but we, if we want to manage the hazard and keep it as it is and reduce its impact on, on our communities then we need to be uh, working back up the watershed hence projects like SNAP and stormwater management and forestry reforestation. So without those programs um, uh, being able to be included, the province did add one line in the act as a result of some of the consultations and it basically said, we might add something else. So it was the, we felt it was sort of a 50% win towards maybe we should have thought about adding the watershed into the, into the programs, but, um, but we're, we're certainly not sure what's, what's going to happen with that. And, and I will compliment CBC for kind of taking the charge on looking at streamlining processes and uh, working with the other conservation authorities throughout Ontario to see if we're going to be changing our business, uh, then these are the things that we need to focus on so we get the biggest bang for our buck. So I will leave it at that. Um, I wish you continued uh, luck in trying to deal with um, the, the current government because the devil, like all of our other programs, will be in the detail and the regulations. I know some of them came out last week but not related to the conservation authorities. So we're expecting those probably this summer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for coming in today. Um, echo some of the comments that uh, Councillor Raz has shared as well. Thanks for all the work you do and also appreciate the funding challenges that uh, you face. I wanted to um, just acknowledge and thank you for your feedback and your input and support for uh, Brampton's motion declaring a climate emergency. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, it shows your support and that umbrella declaration is a commitment from our city to continue to make this a priority. So thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Downey. Thank you to you, Chair. Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Jeff, for coming today. Um, as we are continued, our mandates are challenged by the province. Um, I just want to thank you for your continued efforts. Uh, my phone is silent on the Badlands, so that's great. Thank you. <laughs> um, just that, on that issue in particular. Um, and uh, on Tuesday at our council, we had um, TRCA talking to us about the rejuvenation of Bolton Camp, which is a great project. Um, and I was happy to say, when Councillor Sinclair said, we need more of this on the west side of Caledon, I was happy to point to Mac Park and Bell Fountain. So thank you for bringing the illustrations of that today. Um, I believe those projects, um, although they may not completely align with our mandates or the mandates of the province, um, they're vital to our community. So thank you for that. Thank you, and Deb, thank you very much for this. You know, uh, I have to tell you, if I may, through the chair, say I've been so privileged and so blessed in life in so many ways, and what I thought would be a 30-year career, career that was over, and then you brought me back here. But the only regret I had in taking this appointment, the only regret, was I was hoping to have stayed on at the Credit Valley Conservation. But, of course, when you get a privilege like this from you around the table, you also have to sit on the police board, which means those Fridays are taken up, or otherwise I would never have left. 
And it's easier to leave when you know you've got someone the likes of Councillor Raz there to take over that's doing great work. But what I wanted to mention to you was, as I'd promised, um, I'm just so enamored with the CBC because more than anything, the CBC and the Credit Valley Trail is symbolic of the greatness of the region of Peel. And I promised you, and I wanted to fulfill a promise, um, what I thought was my last term on council, my wife and I, in a very modest way, gave $10,000 to our local hospital that was done. And just recently, as chair, I called in the United Way, and I said, over my next term, thanks to you, I'd like to give $10,000 along with my wife to my two most important causes, the United Way and the Conservation Authority. So over the next four years, I would like to do that. But more importantly, the reason I want to do it is symbolically, I think we all have to do what we can to give. I'm sort of appointing myself your honorary benefactor because where we are able to help people and we have that opportunity and the privilege you've given me as chair, as many of you know, for 30 years I've told the people that we've helped, the businesses and the developers, hey Nando, we've really been great, the city's been grateful, is there anything we can do for you? And I always say the same thing, create jobs, pay taxes and give money back to the community. And what I will be telling them is if you're in a position to do that and we've helped very openly and transparently, give money back to the Credit Valley Trail and I take it upon myself to see if over four years of whatever may come, I can wipe out that quarter million dollars for you. So there you have it, with great honor and great pride. Thank you very much. Councillor Sinclair. Thank you. Just a comment, there was a rather vast number there in the slide deck regarding visitors anticipated to the Bell Fountain Park, Max Park, and uh, something like 780,000 expected. And uh, Bell Fountain's a rather unique situation. It's uh, quite a tiny hamlet. If you go north of Bush Street, you're into the River Valley. If you go immediately south, you're into provincially significant wetlands. If you go to the east, you're right into the Credit River Gorge. There's absolutely no room provide any further parking for visitors in this tight situation. Every sunny weekend, the little hamlet is totally swarmed by visitor parking trying to see something or do something. And um, the Bell Fountain Community Organization, the little incorporated community group, has told Credit Valley Conservation that their preference would be to entirely shut down Max Park. They don't want that to be a destination anymore. Mm. And uh, there's a general problem in Caledon where we have GTA population in general heading towards 7 million people and they all want to come up for an excursion and a Sunday drive. And these conservation areas are becoming more and more important for people in dense urban areas to get out and be in a leafy environment. So we're getting a friction here between the capacity of local communities to accept those visitor loads and, and the demand. So I just point that out. It's, there's a real friction and dichotomy here between the needs of big urban populations and the capacity for people to get out and enjoy it in North Peel. <coughs> And uh, this has to be worked on. I really like the idea of the uh, Credit Valley Trail. And uh, I remember uh, David Cullum was a big one on this, going back in, into 1986, and really worked hard on getting parts of that trail done in Streetsville. So linking Lake Ontario up to Orangeville at the top end is a really important item and one of the best functions that we've ever done in Caledon is to have trail systems. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And on that point, I think the CAO would like to speak, but uh, the way long been an issue around the table, and dare I say, a lot of vigilance on the part of the Caledon councillors that sat on the CBC, so we're well seized of the issue. The only point I would make before we throw it over to Deb is I wouldn't call it so much a problem as a challenge that we have to deal with because in some ways, with respect to our friends, and it's a good problem to have that it's such a success from the, but we have to manage it somehow. I think your point's well made, but I know Deb's well seized of it and the board has been. Deb. 
Thank you, and thank you for your comments. Um, the 750,000, I, I think, is the number you're referring to, is their total visitation in 2018, not just Bell Fountain. So thankfully, because if we'd had that, you're quite right, it would have overwhelmed uh, the community worse than it is today. Uh, the, the reason that we are undertaking the Bell Fountain Management Plan is because of the impact we have on the, on the village of Bell Fountain. So the, the plan includes um, additional parking. It, we've been trying to work with the town of uh, Caledon around finding additional sources of parking that we could support the village. The washroom facility that will be at the mouth, at the entrance of the of our park, will be for public use in Bell Fountain. Given the, and it was part of the um, the negotiations and discussions about what the what the park can do back outside the gate, not just inside the gate. Uh, so a lot of the the village, uh, the Bell Fountain Community Organization, and other other um, stakeholders in the area have provided tremendous input. And at the end of the day, um, we did not get. Uh, uh, any request to close the park, and have we? And I think part of the uh, the concern was we we made quite clear to the residents is that if we close the park, it's closed to everyone. It's not a community. Park. It's not a park anymore for anyone else. And and I don't think that's the right thing for that beautiful spot. So uh, so I think investing in what uh, different different ways and means of operating the site and different uh, infrastructure and uh, and also trying to push people to come at different times of the week as opposed to just waiting on weekends, so we have a, a larger plan for that. One of the things we did do recently was stop doing group picnicking at Bell Fountain because people were coming and staying all day long, and that they can't. Then it, the site was not turning over, and so there was more congestion. So we've tried to do some of those things until such time as we can actually um, update the park itself. So, so we've heard the concerns. We are trying to take measures to do so, but the people are coming, and we and that's the same with you know when you think of what we've done at. at the Badlands, where there was never a, a viewing platform. Well, now we have to have one because there's so many people coming and wanting to see the site. It was destroying the site. So that's basically what we have to look at is providing for more and safer use of those sites. Thank you. And before I go to Councillor Pelesha, I'm so glad you mentioned the Badlands as Councillor Downey did. Same issue. We didn't have a problem. We have a challenge. I think we managed it very well and proved we can surmount those challenges and what a great asset it is now. So I, I'm very confident that this can all be made to work in, in everybody's good hands and best efforts. Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You said a lot of what I wanted to say and, and just to highlight, when, whenever I'm talking to uh, uh, City of Brampton staff about recreations and the, and the challenges that we have, there are, they are good challenges to have but it is about managing those challenges. And I think uh, CBC has done a fantastic job in, in, uh, in what they've had to work with. And, and I just commend you for, for everything that you do. And, um, to, but to be honest with uh, uh, the Badlands, I don't see, it, it won't be a problem in the future once um, the region, Brampton, um, CBC build our environmental education center out in the west end of Brampton. That'll alleviate a lot of the pra traffic concerns. Thank you for coming. Well done. Councillor Raz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to wrap up this conversation on the uh, on um, uh, Bell Fountain, the 750,000 number, 250,000 of that come to Rattray Marsh. And that is down in my ward, and it's connected to Jack Darling Park. Park. So between those two, they are the most two visited parks and probably the GTA based on pure population numbers. So I uh, also appreciate the limited parking. Um, I get complaints every weekend, every nice uh, weekend from local residents where their cars are being parked. But again, it's something that we try to manage. Closing locations is not the option. We as administrators of public land uh, just need to do a better job. And I get assurances from staff that when it comes to Bell Fountain, they are working on it. So um, you can have our assurance that it is being looked after. It's not, uh, there's no panacea to, uh, maybe we can fly people in on drones to alleviate the parking problem eventually. But at this point, um, we just need to manage what we, what we have to deal with. So thank you. Thank you. With that, that concludes my list and the deputation. I ask for a motion of receipt from Councillor Rass and seconded by Councillor Medeiros. All those in favour, show of hands, that is carried. Thank you very much for your presentation today. That brings us right into 7.2. John McKenzie, Chief Executive Officer of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority.
John, welcome. Good morning, uh, Chair Heinika and, uh, and members of uh, Region Appeal Council. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and I just wanted to uh, introduce some of members of my team of, uh, today that are with me. Uh, uh, my, first of all, my name is John McKenzie. I'm the CEO of Toronto Region Conservation Authority. With me today is Michael Talansky, who's our Chief Financial and Operating Officer. Uh, Director Chandra Sharma, who's in, uh, again, on the second row there who is the uh, Director of Com Community Engagement and Outreach. Also, Victoria Kramkowski, who is also the Government and uh, Community Relations Specialist for the Region Appeal. That's a new position that we assigned, so we have the attention that the Region Appeal uh, warrants. Also, Jennifer Moravic is a Supervisor of Strategic Business Planning and Performance, and uh, Jennifer has a lot of close interactions with your staff and uh, wanted to make sure that she was here in case there was any really tricky questions on, uh, on the financing. But uh, I guess I just, uh, before beginning, if there were two things I wanted to leave with you today, uh, number one, first and foremost, we are um, uh, on the target, on target, uh, based on our discussions with staff for 2020. So I want you to be aware that there's uh, been a lot of discussion and we've put together a budget that, that matches with that. The second thing I wanted to leave with you is how appreciative we are for the engagement, involvement, of Region of Peel counselors in our work, in our programs. Uh, they're always there, they're always involved. And, uh, and our chair, of course, now from the Region of Peel, uh, we have uh, a great deal of uh, discussion about the initiatives all across our jurisdiction, but a lot of, uh, a lot of attention on Region of Peel issues. But I also want to uh, really uh, express my thanks to David uh, for the close working relationship we have with your staff. Uh, there's, uh, you know, many of the staff here, Norm Lum, uh, Catherine uh, Matheson, we're going to be working more closely with, Christine too, and, and, and Andrew Farr, Leary, uh, Adrian Smith. There's so many of, of I, I'm probably missing some key staff, but there's so much um, interaction and, and a great working relationship, and I just want to express my sincere gratitude for that close working relationship. Thank you. So very quickly, I'm just going to go through our... Uh, our presentation. Uh, the lands in our, this slide just outlines the lands in our jurisdiction, our service areas, and um, uh, we have organized our, uh, our achievements against key targets that we've had in our strategic plan. And uh, basically, uh, the service areas that I'll speak to uh, are outlined above. So for 2019, TRCA has uh, come forward with a renewed vision, which outlines where we are going and what we can achieve together with our partners, including the Region Appeal. Our renewed mission specifies our purpose and guides our daily operation and decisions. The renewed mission, coupled with our core values and the outcome-based strategic plan from 2018, creates the basis of accountability and success for our organization. I'm just going to go through some of those service areas very quickly. TRCA organizes our activities according to three, Peel's three funding streams, watershed, climate, and infrastructure. This slide outlines some of the outputs within the watershed stream that we will achieve by year end. And uh, this includes watershed planning, reporting, natural heritage work, land use planning, regional monitoring, restoration, flood management, groundwater, as well as the education and stewardship work that uh, is so important. As well, um, similarly, the climate change stream highlights activities and outputs expected for 2019. On infrastructure, our outputs include works to improve our sites across our jurisdiction and address hazards. Uh, we talk about uh, our conservation areas and um, obviously uh, Heart Lake, CA, uh, is very close to Michael, uh, Clareville, other ones across our jurisdiction. We're doing a great deal of work, Albion Hills in the Field Center, and, um, and uh, Glen Haffey as well within your jurisdiction. The watershed studies and strategies service areas focus on providing watershed policy development and technical direction to TRCA and our partner municipalities, including the local municipalities within the region of Peel. 
Priorities in 2019 include the development of an online platform for watershed report cards to enhance the accessibility of watershed condition reports within our for our partners. Two additional projects will increase resiliency through the development and availability of standard climate data sets to inform decision making and heat vulnerability mapping, which identifies priority sites in Peel region. Water risk management, of course, this is a, a main thrust. The water risk management service area applies science and engineering based strategic management of water resources to reduce risk to life and property. Priorities in 2019 include a detailed investigation into the Bolton Ice Jam, and we've had a lot of discussion about that already, and, and again, the involvement of uh, Region Appeal Councillors, and will include recommendations to mitigate future risks. TRC will also provide support throughout the Bolton Burn design, detailed design process where we're doing some planned upgrades there subject to, to capital funding. We have uh, two sanitary infrastructure protection projects which will be completed in 2019, including the finalization of the Peel Village Golf Course project, which then will protect and uh, uh, ensure that uh, your infrastructure is protected and your investments are protected. On regional biodiversity, we include programs and projects that create an integrated approach to ecosystem management. Priority projects in 2019 include the Jefferson, Jordan, and Jayfield Parks Channel Restoration, which will undergo planning and detailed design in 2019. Additionally, both Palgrave and King Park will see the completion of a wetland and stream restoration activities and continued plantings. On green space securement and management, uh, a large component of this is our TRCA regional trail strategy, and, and thank you, Chair, for recognizing that in the earlier presentation, how important these trails are. Uh, the, um, the trails and the regional trail strategy will continue into 2019, and we're working very closely, closely with the Region Appeal staff and municipal partners to ensure that we deliver on annual targets as part of that strategy. At Albion Hills, our master plan implementation uh, has, has continued, and we saw the construction of a pedestrian crossing to better integrate the newly developed event space following the decommissioning of the dam. And that's something that uh, uh, our chair has been talking to me about for quite some time. Uh, additional priorities in 2019 include the construction of a multi-use trail to ensure pedestrian safety and improve access to public use facilities. The Clareville Management Plan is also undergoing additional studies and analysis to see how we can improve public use opportunities, and that involves the City of Brampton, involves the Region Appeal, but there is an opportunity there to have greater access and use of that facility. Tourism recreation provides nature-based outdoor experiences for guests, which make positive impacts to community well-being while advancing the economic development goals for our partner municipalities. As some of the Brampton councillors know, these are very successful events. Like you mentioned before, almost too successful where you have so many people coming out to them, it's fantastic. But through the construction uh, and through the work that we're doing with the, we, we are trying to coordinate and make sure that these events are, are managed appropriately. Uh, through the construction of a two kilometer multi-use trail partnership with Bolton Rotary, the Bolton Camp property will be better connected to the surrounding communities to provide enhanced access to green space. So uh, we're making headway on that. Uh, at Heart Lake, we're hosting the Learn to Fish program in partnership with MNRF. And uh, we see uh, approximately 1,800 participants in that program. Uh, there's a number of uh, new events being hosted in Peel Region, including the Kite Festival, uh, the Trail Fix Relay, which incorporates 110 kilometers of trails through Peel Region, culminating at Albion Hills Conservation Area. TRC will also be implementing energy efficient upgrades at Indian Line Campground, Glen Haffey, as well, to improve overall sustainability of our operations. On planning development, uh, we continue to administer and, and implement our legislated and delegated responsibilities. And I just want to uh, commend my staff and the team. Uh, they've now put out new uh, regulatory mapping, screening mapping, probably one of the first CAs to do this, as far as I know. Uh, it's one thing that has been uh, requested and, and is now in the act, uh, and the regulations uh, are coming out requiring these updated uh, mapping regulations, but we've gotten there already and, and that's something that we've done with a lot of consultation with stakeholders and with staff and I want to uh, mention that that is something that we just um, uh, had endorsed by our board of directors which will help screen where a permit is required or isn't required. Uh, TRC has continued to support our partners in the development of both the Caledon employment lands, downtown Brampton of course, 
the redevelopment to maximize opportunities to enhance the function of our natural systems and integrate low impact development in key areas. And um, uh, another, other projects include detailed design and permitting for Peel East West Diversion Sewer, of which uh, a design option was selected in 2017. So there's a lot of work that goes on to facilitate infrastructure of the region of Peel, and uh, there's a great working relationship that I mentioned with staff to achieve these outcomes. On education and outreach, we support curriculum objectives for environmental education in schools and build professional uh, competencies across the jurisdiction. Uh, we're focusing on our partnerships with the University of Toronto to deliver uh, Indigenous employment training at Bolton Camp, and also we're, uh, we're, we're um, continuing with the Girls Can Too program, which is, uh, I know, uh, very supported by the region of Peel. It's now in its fifth year, and it promotes trade jobs and equal learning opportunities for young women in grades 7 to 12. A new in 2019, through a partnership between TRC and EcoSpark, we'll see the delivery of the Living Rivers Changing Currents program, which will engage five schools through education and workshops about waterways and the importance of, uh, of uh, addressing climate change. The Sustainable Communities program and projects are developed to address gaps and to implement watershed plans and efforts and coordinate efforts across the region. In this service area is the newest SNAP project located in Bramalee, which is the Regions of Peel's fourth SNAP initiative. Work in 2019 will focus around collecting and evaluating data to develop themes and opportunities for the project. Uh, additionally, partners and many of you are also on the Partners in Project Green board. Uh, partners in Project Green uh, underwent a strategic refresh to direct activities over the next five years to ensure better alignment and support of partner municipality goals and objectives. Uh, TRC is also undertaking two pilot projects in Brampton aimed at mitigating the thermal impacts of stormwater ponds on aquatic life. Corporate services oversees the financial, administrative, and technical services that enable TRCA staff to deliver on objectives. And uh, TRC is proceeding with a new head office at Five Shoreham Drive with the groundbreaking of the project in 2019. This has been a very long time coming. Uh, the construction of the mass timber and sustainably designed building is currently forecasted to be complete in 2021. As well in our facilities, there's been the Heart Lake Water Main Installation Project, and that was commissioned in 2019 as a result of the partnership with the Region Appeal in obtaining funding through the Clean Water Wastewater Fund. The funding helped to address the potable water quality issues and aging infrastructure at Heart Lake Conservation Area. Electrical system upgrades at Glen Haffey Conservation Area have also uh, taking place, and, and, and they also address significant aging infrastructure. These upgrades will reduce the risk of service interruptions and, uh, and protect our assets, collective assets. Funding related to climate change projects in 2019 have been vetted, sorry, uh, through the climate change risk assessment methodology, with the majority falling into the invest category, followed by act and sustain, and we're working very closely with the Region Appeals Office of Climate Change and Energy Management and we'll continue to refine the project details to optimize alignment, coordination, and the collective impact of our organizations. Initiated in 2018, TRC in partnership with the Region of Peel and CVC is leading the development of a performance management framework and associated key KPIs, key performance indicators, which will be used to evaluate the impacts of TRCA and CVC initiatives undertaken with the Region of Peel climate change funding portfolio. Phases one to three of the project will be complete, completed by year end, with phase four forecast to be complete by 2020. And this again aligns our conservation authority work and climate initiatives with region appeal priorities to provide um, you know, the work to, to ensure that we deliver uh, prioritized work across the climate change partnership. So as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, TRCA has met the original approved target provided by the region for 2020. Our target for 2020 is made up of 1.98 million in general levy and 17.106 million in special levy with an additional 25K of special funding for emerald ash borer uh, management for a total of 19.11 million. Uh, because of the provincial funding impact, uh, we have this slide that just uh, outlines that um, uh, the funding announcements, which affect the MNRF Section 39 program, uh, amount to uh, 42,000 in reduction. So we wanted to just outline that because I know that's been a question that came up earlier. Uh, 
This slide outlines our uh, revised three-year forecast after considering the impacts from provincial funding outlined in the pre previous slide. Uh, we have um, again have a revised target of $1.98 million in general levy and $17.09 million in special levy. So we've met their target based on the work of staff, and that's why I think, uh, again, I'm so complimentary about the, uh, the work of the staff. So I guess we talked about uncertainty, and there was a, a, a point made by Deb uh, previously about the question marks and, uh, and some conversation about that. But that is really the risk to outcomes in achieving our 2020 target really um, can be summarized as proposed changes to the CA Act, which have, we've now seen the Act, but it's the regulations now. What, what comes forward may require adjustments to the memorandum of understanding or service level agreements that we have already. And we have a number of agreements with the region of Peel, with our municipal partners in Peel, and these are gonna have to be updated. So any services not deemed to be core under the Act may need to be captured in updated MOUs and service level agreements with Peel and lower tier municipal partners. And, and I, think, I think that's a key point that I wanted to make here uh, today. Um, uh, TRC activities that are non-core can no longer be funded through the region appeal levy without your express approval through service level agreements and, or through an MOU. And so we need to continue to work very closely with region appeal staff to determine which ones can be funded through the existing levy and which ones must be funded separately. So Peel staff also, when we work with you, will need to understand the services offered through um, our other non-core non programs, which provide a number of benefits to the region of Peel and to your partner and to our local municipalities. So we need to make sure that these services that are deemed desirable are captured in future MOUs and service level agreements with, with the region. Uh, as of two weeks ago, our board of directors endorsed a template of a memorandum of understanding service level agreement as a basis for discussion with the region appeal and our local municipalities. And, um, and I think that's going to uh, be a very important, important working uh, discussion over the next number of months so we can continue to uh, uh, ensure that we can deliver the services that your communities require and that we work uh, hand in hand to ensure seamless service delivery. So I would just like to say in closing um, uh, how appreciative we are of the opportunity to work with your team, Chair, uh, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and um, I would like to uh, answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Yes, thank you and thank you for your presentation. And we too are appreciative, I mentioned before, what an honor to have the Chair of the CBC and the Chair of the TRCA sit around <laughs> this table and both serving us so well. With that, that's our next speaker, MTRCA Chair Jennifer Innes. Jennifer. Thank you, Chair. It's also interesting that it's, it's two conservatives that are the chair. Who says you can't be green and conservative, right? Um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, start by saying thank you to John and Michael for, uh, for your presentation today. Um, and as Councillor Raz had mentioned with regards to Bill 108 and the mandate, the core mandate and the funding being aligned with that core mandate, um, the MOUs, as you touched on at the end, are very, very important for our partner municipalities. So I encourage our staff to continue to work. I know that we have a great working relationship, um, but those MOUs and those service level agreements are going to become even more important and it's also important that as um, counselors that we actually are involved in that process to make sure that um, the programs and services that are important to our communities are part of those MOUs and those service level agreements. So I just want to point that out. And, um, and also to commend staff with regards to the new grants team program that you brought forward because without comprising that team, we wouldn't be able to leverage some of the funding that we have been able to, especially in this past year, um, with our federal and provincial partners because they're always looking for shovel-ready projects. Um, that's how their funding typically works, and we've had some really great success, and, and we're going to need more of that moving forward given the changes 
to um, to the Conservation Act. Um, and as a councillor who represents the Bolton area as well, I'd like to say thank you very, very much for your assistance during the flooding in Bolton in the downtown core and the ice jam. Um, there was a great partnership between regional staff as well as uh, TRCA staff and our emergency services at the town of Caledon and with some support from the city of Brampton. So um, thank you very, very much for that. And one of the other things that I wanted to touch on was the trail strategy um, and how important that is for the region of Peel as we are you know, a promoter of active transportation um, and uh, ask that we continue, our staff continue to work with your staff to enhance those trail connectivities and opportunities to get people off of the road and um, living healthier and more active lives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fonseca. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, uh, John and Michael, for being here. I'll echo what uh, Councillor Innes, Chair TRCA, uh, has expressed with regards to the importance of the MOUs. Um, and I want to really thank you also for, in these uh, changing times and uh, rapid uh, growth and development in urbanized areas, uh, for helping us uh, at the Conservation Authority um, look to many different ways as to how we can best integrate nature and the built environment. Uh, I think that's so important, not only right now, but also moving forward. The reality is uh, that we will continue to have a built environment that grows and intensifies uh, in the region of Peel and throughout the TRCA watershed. And um, we are calling on your expertise as well. Sometimes it's tough discussions that we're having at the TRCA, um, but thank you for uh, holding, us, holding us accountable uh, to have these tough discussions and uh, to ensure that that integration continues to, um, continues to happen. But also uh, you mentioned in your presentation rethinking green space and how to maximize it. I would like to add optimize it, but also for all of us to respect it. Um, that's something that can be a challenge when we're, prevented, uh, when we're presented um, at our local municipalities or at the region or at the Conservation Authority um, with uh, opportunities uh, when it comes to development. Um, and I think respecting that green space and seeing how moving forward it can, it can um, contribute better to uh, sustainable, resilient communities is so very important. I wanna thank you so much for uh, your water risk management, uh, flood mapping, and also strategies um, to address this. Um, we experienced, I experienced in my ward, but in uh, Mississauga in 2013, um, substantial flooding along the Etobicoke Creek and Little Etobicoke Creek and uh, down into uh, Lake Ontario and so on the east side of Mississauga. And this flood mapping and all of the support that's gone into that and commitment from the TRCA um, is so important to bring to the table um, now and moving forward into the future when it comes to strategy for uh, planning and development. Um, and also um, how we can illustrate to um, the communities and some of our community nodes, for example, Dixie Dundas in my area, that's, this is a, a big community node. Uh, we have a plan for uh, Dundas Connects, which is uh, redeveloping Dundas, but without having this uh, floodplain uh, mapping, or flood mapping and floodplain um, uh, expertise and expansion of where that floodplain has um, unfortunately expanded to, um, we can't plan in the right way. So I wanna say thank you for that. I will also echo what Councillor uh, Innes has said about the regional trail strategy. Um, the Etobicoke Creek Trail, and I see Chandra up in the stands here. I wanna give a particular shout out to her. When I first uh, got onto uh, council in 2010, uh, I got onto the Mississauga Cycling Advisory Committee. And uh, I think Chandra came a number of times to our meetings and listen to the cycling advocates talk about, we need to connect this Etobicoke Creek Trail. We need to connect it. And um, it had been ongoing for a number of years, I think 20 plus years. Um, so uh, now, thankfully, uh, based on all of the support from TRCA, also all the elected officials in uh, Mississauga, Brampton, Calden, 
also Toronto, uh, because the portion of the Etobicoke Creek Trail winds into uh, Toronto as well. Um, there's over 50 kilometers of trail uh, that people can ride along the Etobicoke Creek from Caledon all the way down to the lake. And um, they can ride it for pleasure or uh, also to access into their communities and for commuter purposes. So thank you to that. And finally, I just wanna thank you for encouraging individuals businesses, organizations to learn more about how they can have uh, every little thing that they do, how they can have uh, a significant change when it comes to our watershed and our climate. Um, and you've, uh, the TRCA and the Conservation Authority is working through uh, uh, examples are SNAP, but also partners in Project Green. Um, uh, you've helped to show people on the ground in their neighborhoods that there are manageable ways that they can um, contribute um, to, uh, to making their community more sustainable and more resilient. So I wanna thank you very much and I, I look forward to continuing to uh, support TRCA as a board member. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. It's. Um, it's a real honor and privilege to sit on the board of the TRCA as a climate uh, advocate. Um, I'm not going to repeat some of the things that Councillor Innes and Councillor Fonseca have shared because I also share the same opinion as them. Um, but I will highlight that I'm a lucky person to live um, really close to the Tobacco Creek Trail and I um, ride it, I run it um, very often and no one has mentioned la what happened this past weekend which is the phenomenal Bike the Creek um, that the TRC hosted where we have gone from 200 riders um, not too long ago to over a thousand riders on Bike the Creek um, just this past weekend. And I know Councillor Pileshi, I was witness to him riding uh, the, the event this year. <laughs> And it was a record number. And so th this past weekend is just another example of how, you know, the TRCA is doing things to connect people with the amazing work that we are doing um, at the TRCA. Um, I also wanted to thank you as well, similar to the CBC, for your endorsement of our motion to declare a climate emergency um, and also for your feedback. I know that the board um, endorsed the motion and supports it as well. So thank you very much. And for everyone in the public gallery and anyone who are keenly watching this on so on uh, online right now, make sure to check out the Etobicoke Creek Trail. So thanks very much. Thank you, and Councillor Demerla. I want to thank you both for uh, coming here and uh, presenting. I just want to say what a privilege it is to work on the board and on the executive. Um, you know, my colleagues have talked a lot about some of the great work that you do. I echo that. But I do want to say one thing, which is of all of the things that you do, and I can't really say that one is more important than the other, but definitely one that's very important is you are our first and last line against development in the wrong areas. And that is something that is really, really important. It uh, doesn't get talked about as much because it's not a project, but it is definitely one of those things. Uh, I, my ward, a significant part of my ward, happens to be in the floodplain. Some of it is administered by the CVC, and some of it is administered by the TRCA. And um, often, I'm really glad to be able to have my staff say, I don't think the t I mean, you know, it depends if the TRCA says it's a go, well, that's a good thing. That gives me comfort. But it's also good to know that you guys are there to say no uh, when something shouldn't be there. So thank you for that. That's a really big one uh, that often gets uh, missed. And also, you know, we've talked about the MOUs uh, that you may have to sign with the Region of Peel if some of those services get... Uh, designated as non-essential, but also along with that comes the question of how we fund them. So that is a really big issue uh, as council that we will all have to grapple as this government uh, changes what it funds and what it doesn't fund. The work still needs to be done. And I think we will all have those very difficult choices of having to prioritize. So once again, thank you and look forward to working with you. 
Thank you very much, and that exhausts my list. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation. Councillor, actually Chair Jennifer Innes of the MTRCA will move that receipt along with Councillor Santos. All those in favor, that is carried. And I think a real red letter day for the region today that to have two chairs that sit here, a former chair that sat there, and I was remiss in not acknowledging Councillor Mahoney for the yeoman work he's been doing behind the scenes on the Credit Valley Trail, for some of the challenges we have at some pinch points. And I know the work you've been doing behind the scenes, Matt. Thank you very much. And we'll win there too. All right, with that, I go to item 7.3 on my list, and that is Deputant Ms. Christina Zampiero, resident regarding the installation of 5G wireless infrastructure in Peel. And Ms. Zampieri, as you're coming up, I will make you aware in discussions with staff that we in council have a report coming to us in the fall from our medical officer of health on this file, this emerging file. So I wanted to make you aware of that. And of course, we have a five minute time limit on your presentation. I Please understand. proceed. Hello? Okay. Hi, I'm Christina. Can you hear me okay? I don't have to Dan. This is my colleague, Veronica. So thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I'm here to talk about 4 and 5G wireless health dangers and removing it from our schools. Science and medicine are warning that wireless radiation causes damage to DNA, cancer, infertility, autism, ADHD, and behavioral problems. The, science, the scientific debate is over. The 4G levels to which we are currently exposed are adversely affecting human health. Next generation 5G will exponentially increase these fields, and none of that tech, including the gadgets, were ever independently tested for harm to biological life before being allowed to blanket our communities. But industry in its position has used its influence on national committees to provide endless discussion of the science, which apparently led to no conclusion. But now, with the statements of International Agency for Research on Cancer, with a succession of animal studies by Chu in 92, by Ripacioli in 97, and by the NTP recently confirmed by Ramazzini in Italy, there is scientific evidence that is so strong that you can be certain that Health Canada standards are wrong. The 2016 10-year $30 million study conducted by the National Institute of Health was supposed to demonstrate that there were no effects of radiation below thermal, and in fact, it demonstrated exactly the opposite and it follows on the heels of two major animal studies that said exactly the same thing. They repeatedly found evidence of cancer. Health Canada Safety Code 6 has not been updated in over 40 years. It still only considers thermal effects, a cell phone's ability to heat the brain of a huge mannequin. What about babies, children, pregnant women? Where are the accommodation for those with electrosensitivity sickness? It's not enough to routinely meet concerns with emissions are well within Health Canada guidelines. These guidelines indicate acceptable radiation levels, which are orders of magnitude above what has been demonstrated as safe when non-thermal effects are considered. Health Canada's Code 6 is not protective and hundreds of times less stringent than other nations. Hardwired fiber optic cable is safer, faster, and more secure and would avoid wirelessly radiating millions of unsuspecting citizens. The writing is on the wall. Please pause the 5G rollout. Would you truthfully want to live next to a cell tower given the choice? Cell towers placed too close to people violate our human right to protect our health. They violate our right not to be experimented upon. I certainly do not consent to a military grade small cell facility on the light post outside my front door. Beaming military carrier waves into homes constitutes trespassing, and if it makes me uncomfortable because science has proven it causes harm, that's called assault. Can Peel be sued for protecting me and refusing an inappropriate antenna placement? Who has the final authority? This is the most important function of our government. Since Wi-Fi causes cancer, it does not belong in our schools. Kill, kids absorb 75% more radiation. There are laws banning it in Australia, India, Spain, Switzerland, Italy, Austria, Germany, Israel, Cyp Cyprus, and Finland. Please regulate tighter restrictions. You did it for peanut allergies. To not respect developments in science, warnings of top scientific experts would seem crazy. Would you have your child ingest something that hundreds of peer-reviewed studies say is harmful? Just last week, I had this conversation with a not-for-profit preschool, and this week, the school was hardwired, and those children are now safer for it. 
The reality is that this is the greatest environmental and safety threat of our time. The public is getting sick and the government isn't up to date with the science. This is when we need our representatives to represent. Please don't tell me it's not within your jurisdiction. This is not on the news because telecoms own the media. But they warn their shareholders about future financial risks from EMF because no one will insure them. Where's my warning when I buy their products? I need a magnifying glass to read the manufacturer's insert that says don't put the thing to your head. You see, if they keep the scientific argument about safety going, the apparent lack of certainty helps reassure customers that their phone addiction is hopefully harmless. Hold wireless companies accountable for keeping their tech safe. Refuse industry-funded evidence and eliminate individuals with strong financial ties to industry from governing committees. There's way too much money in politics. The two takeaways are our kids need to learn about technology from safely hardwired devices, not wireless. And respect to four, with respect to 4 and 5G, appropriate testing must happen before it's allowed to roll out. I just got a good email from Oregon State. The Senate uh, just passed wireless bill 283 for schools on June 13th, and they declared an emergency. So it's coming closer to us. It's, it's time to protect the kids. Thanks so much. Thank you for your presentation and staying right on five minutes. Are there any questions of clarification of the deputant reminding you and all that a report is coming back to us in the fall on the broader subject? I have a list. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Ms. Sampira, for your uh, delegation. This is a question that has been vexing residents for quite some time. And uh, as the um, communication sector continues to uh, evolve and uh, move towards 5G technologies, the kinds of questions you were posing here today, um, I can attest are intensifying. And so just as a question to the Medical Officer of Health for the benefit of the uh, deputant, what is the status right now of the Regions of Peel, uh, Region of Peel's um, looking into this issue? Dr. Hopkins. Through the chair, so staff are currently conducting a review of the health evidence related to this issue and we will report back in the early fall to regional council on that. We've also been in touch with both Public Health Ontario and Health Canada who are looking at the issue as well and we'll report on that. Thank you. And because I know one of the things that uh, folks tend to um, read a lot about is studies that purport that um, uh, radiation that comes from cell towers uh, when uh, administered to uh, lab, in the lab test type of environment. One of the things that's not explained very well are the, um, first of all, the types of radiation used, but also the intensity and the proximity of that radiation to uh, the animal that's being tested. And so that's an important factor. And one of the um, ideas behind 5G as an evolution of telecommunications technology is that the energy levels uh, by their design are meant to be much lower than even the 4G uh, communications technology. And so that's one thing that we're looking forward to see uh, what the science really says and how it really affects. Because the fact is, is that radiation is everywhere and what really affects whether or not it has an impact on rates of cancer or tissue damage is really dependent on the level of the energy that is being used. And so we look forward to that information coming and to having uh, that information presented to Council for its consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Thank you, through you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. I think my question is more for staff. Um, the deputant mentioned um, best practices in other countries, so I'm wondering how Canada's Safety Code 6 compares to those other countries. Through the Chair, uh, Health Canada set Safety Code 6 to protect the public. Uh, this is science-based and similar to the uh, requirements in other countries, including the United States, the European Union, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Thank you. Um, sorry to the delegation. You'd mentioned that um, certain countries have already banned um, the use of this technology. Can you just uh, elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, they put laws in place to limit the exposure for children. Um, I'll show you the visual. Uh, children absorb 
we have very much thinner skulls. They have multiple, uh, they're rapidly multiplying DNA and lower immune systems make them much more susceptible. This is an adult brain compared to a child's brain. The absorption rate is much more. They're not small people, they're different beings. And, and the idea that we're electromagnetic beings and that a bombarding external source of electromagnetic um, radiation doesn't affect us in a non-thermal, non-ionizing way is, is pure fantasy. Um, our bodies work with electrical impulses. So uh, I'm just wondering uh, how, um, you know, what steps they've taken to ban um, Well, Italy technology. did a big ceremony and, and unplugged the Wi-Fi and they hardwired the school with an ethernet cable, you know, in little junction boxes and the kids can pl uh, plug their tech with an ethernet cable. Those devices don't emit mm -hmm. when they're hardwired. It's, it's a pretty simple solution. Um, it's, it's, the, it's having those waves going through the air that, that hits their, their little bodies. And, um, and they're finding, in the case of Oregon, uh, these clusters of you know, tumors and people with radiation sickness in those areas. And, that prom and the closer you live to a cell tower, I mean, there's hundreds of studies I could send you. Kaiser Permanente did one where they put electrodes on the bellies of pregnant women. And the closer they lived to the magnetic field, they tripled their, their, ch their chances of miscarriage in that pregnancy. So it's, it's pretty conclusive evidence. It's just been war-gamed, unfortunately, by industry. They've gotten free reign. So, so, so the reason I'm, I'm asking, you, you mentioned India as well. I've been to India, obviously. Uh, yeah. my, my parents are from there. I go yeah. back once in a while, and they have... Uh, cell phone cell phone towers everywhere. Yes. Um, like in the right in the middle of places you wouldn't expect. And so, uh, I'm just wondering what steps they'll be taking. Will will they be moving them? Like, um, will they be repositioning them? Like, they need to be away from people. No, but so you had mentioned that they they they've banned. The well, they've taken yeah in the schools they've taken measures to 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 ban Wi-Fi. So they, uh, what I'm, I'm indicating just that they unplugged the Wi-Fi and hardwired their tech. Um, okay. Not and also I mean I I'm sure they're addressing at the same time placements of cell phone towers. You don't want to put one right on top of a daycare, right? But the five G uh, tech uh, the infrastructure is more extensive because the waves don't carry as far. They actually do, I saw a Verizon commercial where they carry 3,000 feet, but the first part of that journey is right into somebody's bed, you know, right into their front door because they're putting them right on the light post. I can show you a photo in an article, 15 feet from the lady's house. There's no way she's not going to. Now, 3% of the population will have immediate effects uh, called radiation sickness. It has an ICD code. It's in the medical books, but 30% will have a, a a more prolonged, uh, it'll take a little longer uh, for the effects to show. Because when the effects are low, as Mr. Vicente said, our body, it doesn't mount that uh, defensive reaction. It's right. too low, it's coming in under the radar so the body doesn't remove it. I just kind of wanted to get uh, a read on what the, the other countries yeah. have Yeah, so done. they are taking so measures to eliminate Wi-Fi around children. And cell phones, too. They, they radiate quite a bit, too. You need to put those on airplane or turn them off. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that exhausts my list, Ms. Empiero. Thank you very much for your presentation. You heard we will be getting a full report back in the fall. I would welcome you, if you like, if your presentation is in writing or any questions you may have, mm -hmm. to pass those on to our medical officer of health so you know they can be considered in the report that's coming forward. Sure. And you were awaiting uh, on 5G, or which aspect of my presentation are you awaiting a report on? What I will do is perhaps through to the medical officer of health and our staff, what is the nature of the report and its scope that will be coming back to us in the fall? Uh, through the chair, we were going to report back on 5G as that was the topic of this delegation. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I can I have receipt of the delegation. That's been moved by Councillor Vincente, seconded by Councillor Dillon. All those in favor? That is carried, thank you. And that brings us to our next presentation that we've moved up from 17.1 with regards to the request for development charges relief the Church of Arking, Joel Michael and St. Tecla and Mayor Brown has asked to have this brought forward. Mayor Brown, how would you like the matter dealt with? 
If we could put the motion on the floor, but I'd like the ward councillor, uh, councillor Pleshi to speak to it first, okay. and it'll be moved by myself and seconded by uh, councillor Starr. Okay, very good. The first thing that I need to do, though, is this. It is not a matter that is before me on the agenda, so Madam Clerk, I believe I require two. I'd like to see them. You don't, there is a report with a recommendation. You don't need two. Oh, very good. So we can carry on because it's a motive that yeah. flows up from the report. Very good. So with that, I will go to my list then. Uh, having a mover and a seconder as duly, and it says Mayor Brown, but Mayor Brown, just to be clear on who you thought the movers and the second, is it as I read it there? Yes. Very good. With that, I will go to my list. Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, I, I do support the motion that's before us, and I, I just wanted Council to understand a little bit um, some of the history. I'm not going to give you all the history because we don't have... Um, at least 15 hours to talk about, you know, the church's issues, the historical board's issue, uh, or the region, the city. The, the Coptic Church has identified an issue in the north end of Brampton, and that issue is the lack of recreation. Um, they're, they're building something to provide a service to the residents um, um, of Brampton, Caledon, and Mississauga if they want to, uh, if they want to utilize this facility. Um, I think that uh, in the report it talks a, it talks a little bit about you know private sector uh, daycares um, and and us not uh, alleviating them of any DCs. Um, it's a little bit different with this not-for-profit church that uh, that does give so much back to the community. Um, taking a little step back in in the beginning of of the construction of the church. Um, and then on to kind of the phase two where the issues had started. So I think um, if, if you know, we lived in a perfect world and there were no issues at that time, this wouldn't be before us because we would be talking about um, uh, the DCs taking back to, uh, to the beginning stages. But uh, so that's what I, I just wanted members of council just to, to keep in mind is, is what we're kind of asking is, uh, is a rewind on um, on what the DC charges uh, were back then compared to now and, and having a, an opportunity to uh, uh, provide them with um, um, the means of, of them bringing something that's great into the community and, and much needed in uh, the residents of Valleywood and, and Snell Grove and uh, even Mississauga. So thank you uh, for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mayor Brown. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And just to add a little bit more of history uh, to this, uh, I think it goes beyond the fact this is going to provide child, child care spaces and recreation in the community. One of the reasons they go back to when it was originally uh, uh, initiated um, was because, frankly, the city of Brampton and the region of Pales bear some responsibility for the delays. I think that's what makes this situation unique. Um, the region and the city gifted uh, um, a heritage property to um, to this church that caused uh, delays. Uh, I think when it was gifted to them, they felt it would be pretty seamless. It wasn't. As you know, with any heritage issue, it really complicates it. Um, and thanks to Caledon, we found a unique solution where the that heritage structure is being gifted to a charity in uh, Caledon, and so they're now able to proceed. But it was that complication um, that really uh, caused a delay on something the church was ready to go on years ago. Uh, and I think that's why we um, bear some of the responsibility. They're not asking for their development charges to be waived. They are simply asking to go back to the starting gate when the delays uh, started happening. Um, they're still going to be paying $283,608 in development charges. So they're chipping in for local infrastructure. I think this is just uh, fairness and recognition of uh, some of our responsibility and the delays and the fact that there's a significant community benefit uh, for recreation and child care in the, in, in the, in the region of Peel. Um, and I would note uh, the city of Brampton is also, um, uh, our planning committee, our, our, our city committee also recognize that uh, a burden and has been assisting uh, as well. And I just want to thank Councillor uh, Starr um, for uh, seconding this. I, I, I think we all appreciate the Coptic community has 
um, been a major benefit to whether it's Father Angelos and, and the team in Mississauga, uh, or of course uh, the, um, the the team in Brampton, uh, and uh, we appreciate everything the Coptic community does uh, to enhance uh, our community in, in the region of Peel. Thank you, Councillor De Merla. Thank you, Chair. I believe. Uh, when the deputants came forward last time, we had asked the city to bring forward a re comprehensive report on the issue. So I think it would be useful for us to hear the city's presentation. I know they already have something in the agenda before we vote on this because they're sort of related. So uh, it doesn't make sense for us to vote on this motion and then the city brings forward its rationale for whether something should be done or shouldn't be done. Oh, no, yeah, last time. Mayor, yeah I'm, I'm not clear on how to proceed to try to address your concern. Mayor Brown, I don't know if you can help me out. I'm not sure of the report that you speak to other than what we have before us. We, we have... There's a staff report that speaks to this issue, so I think they should both be dealt together. The staff should present for us uh, on the issue. They, they do talk about... Uh, they have a recommendation on this issue. And I think it would be useful for all of us to have that discussion before we vote on this. And certainly, and I think that's well put, I certainly can ask our regional staff if you want them to pronounce further to the report before us. I'm a little encumbered in terms of getting the Brampton staff to speak to it other than what's been presented. Uh, okay, very oh, good. So sorry. you'd like to hear from our staff yes. here. Very good. Uh, with that, through to staff, any questions, comments that you'd like to make with regards to the motion before us and the report before us? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through the chair, thank you. There is there is no presentation. I think the report itself is a standalone report with the staff recommendation that the DC charges be applied in accordance with the development charge bylaw. The report does outline that when the place of worship component of the facility was built back in uh, originally, there was an exemption provided for the uh, place of worship piece of the facility, which is what the DC bylaw currently allows as an eligible exemption. The expansion uh, is not an expansion for the most part of that place of worship, which is why it draws uh, development charges in accordance with Peel's development charge bylaw based upon the current rates. Uh, the report does outline other places of worship who have paid DCs at the current rates. Uh, you've heard from uh, two of the councillors in terms of the un uniqueness of this uh, particular development in terms of the delays and so on. Um, it certainly creates a change from what's in the bylaw. Um, it's inconsistent with the bylaw. We don't have a policy that provides these kinds of uh, tax uh, funded grants. Um, and there is a risk uh, to further challenges uh, or a request for reductions in development charges. Thank you. Councillor DeMerle, you still have the floor. Anything further? Yeah, I had some questions for staff, if Please that's okay. Please carry on. Yes. So, Stephen, my question would be, um, the report suggests that if this, if this privilege was extended to other like institutes or organizations in the past five, is, I thought it was past five years, uh, the total hit to our treasury would be $15 million. Could you just um, elaborate on that? And are you comparing apples to apples? For, uh, through the chair, for the places of worship the, um, that have, are similar types of developments, um, the cost is a hit of $2.7 million. If council chose to refund those or if they were to come forward with a request for a rebate, um, there is no obligation today to refund them, but I think that it does set a precedent and a risk that council should be aware of, and our solicitor may want to speak to more to that component. For the uh, not-for-profit and childcare type spaces, um, the total hit is about $12.8 million in terms of those who've paid at the current rates over the past five years. So the total is about $15 million. Uh, now, I know that uh, the ward councillor mentioned two things. One is that there's a gym component to this. So are we still comparing apples to apples when we say other, um, I guess, child care operators? If you took the for-profit out, because that's a different category and only had the not-for-profit child care operators, what would be the hit? Uh, that would be one question. And then the second question is, uh, I think Mayor Brown raised the issue of the delays were from the side of the region 
and the city of Brampton. And I just wanted to know, is that something that we usually take into consideration when applying DC charges? If the delay is on the side of the municipality, whether the municipality has in the past then said that the applicable DCs will be from a time when perhaps if there hadn't been delays, we could have gone forward. Through the chair, thank you. I think I have three questions embedded in there. The first was, re was with respect to the gym space. Um, all other developments that have gyms would pay development charges similar to this. The second one, we don't differentiate for profit and not for profit. It's the services that they utilize, so the access water, wastewater services, regional roads, policing, and so forth. So it's really based on the need and the infrastructure that has to go in place to service um, the place. It's not whether they're for profit or not for profit. With respect to the delays, uh, this is a unique situation. I've never seen a request come forward. Um, I don't have the full history on all of the ins and outs of the delay that was mentioned, um, but we have not gone back and issued a rebate under these circumstances in the past. And did the solicitor have something on that point as well? You still have the floor, Councillor Demerla. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are two types of legal risk associated with this, and uh, one is as to the jurisdiction of the region to make the grant. Um, the courts have given municipalities fairly wide berth on making grants where a municipal benefit can be identified, and there has been uh, reference to municipal benefits. Uh, my concern about the risk is that it may not have been uh, documented um, sufficiently to withstand uh, a challenge if one were to be made on that basis that there isn't a sufficient municipal benefit. Uh, one of the municipal benefits that's been pointed to is the sort of uh, equitable redress for this past delay. And uh, again, the, just the, the report itself doesn't reference that particular consideration. So I'd be uh, concerned about uh, whether there's been a sufficient demonstration of municipal benefit um, to exercise the region's jurisdiction. The other legal risk point is the one that uh, Stephen identified as uh, setting a precedent or uh, it's not just a sort of moral precedent, uh, it's potentially a legal precedent as well that's being established uh, in that somebody could come forward uh, with a pl another place of worship in the, in the future and try to make a, uh, a similar argument. The uh, Mississauga approach to this, where they also uh, provide a grant, uh, addresses it slightly differently in that it's across the board, the, the grant's available in, in all cases, and it's a capped amount. So I think that approach is quite defensible. It's not that you can't use a grant in these circumstances. Uh, it, it's just that there's fairly thin uh, justification for that on the record at this point. Thank you. So, Chair, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I really appreciate um, the clarifications provided by staff. And this is a really difficult uh, decision. And I think it always comes down to the same thing. Case by case, there's a lot of merit to every individual ask. But I think we have to ask ourselves if it's, if it's a good policy for one organization, then perhaps we should look at either doing it for everybody or then asking why we do it for one group and not for other groups. And I think that's the crux of the matter. So if we feel strongly that uh, we should do it today, then I think as council, then we should say, well, then that should be a policy for all of the groups that would fall in the same category. So uh, I'm going to find it hard to, uh, and this is really hard because um, we all want to uh, support the community groups. But when I look at the $15 million potential risk, you know, and I look at the fact that yesterday um, our officials came forward in Mississauga and put our budget forward. And, and you know, the five, uh, I was looking at the numbers and $5 million a year is what we are setting aside for, for the next four years to expand our fire protection footprint. That's the 15 million here. So it's a, it's a lot of money that we are talking about and how we prioritize as a council is really important, especially given the changes that are coming. 
uh, in terms of funding from senior levels of government. So just in the interest of fairness, because I feel that if it's good for one group, then it ought to be good for all groups. And if we can afford to do it for all groups, I would be happy to do it. But if we can only do it for one group, that does trouble me. So I'm going to find it hard to support it just on that principle and, and not on the merits of the individual case, which I completely see. Yeah. Perhaps as chair, if I could, uh, Councillor DeMerle, I think I can make it even harder for you to support, and yet I'm trying to be helpful. Um, Councillor DeMerle, before your time and in mine, you and I had the South Korean church on Grandview Park that did not get the grant because they applied afterwards and fulfilled all the criteria. I know for years, Councillor Starr has done great work at helping some of his church organizations, and some have won and some did not. The fine point that I'm making is the report that was written today was written on this isolated situation and staff looking at it in and of itself said, here are the policies, you shouldn't do it. I think the question is emerging that, and here's my specific concern, the lawyer talked about a precedent. I'm not worried about a precedent. I'm worried about the a precedent and those that will come back and say, no, you're going to apply it retroactively because our circumstance was similar. In the case of the South Korean church, what they got taxed on was their gymnasium, that's their meeting space. Uh, daycare, gymnasium, what do we tell them? And so the fine point that I'm making is the report wasn't written to look at this holistically. It was to talk about this one example. I can assure you many more <laughs> will be coming back. And so as chair, I'm asking before I move on, is it the wish of council to refer this back to the next meeting and say to staff, if you look at it in its totality, what does this mean in terms of a precedent? And what does it mean in terms of what we've done in the past? And what is a new procedure going forward for everyone? Uh, because Dipika, the first thing, I'll be sitting down with you right away and we're gonna go meet with our friends in your ward and they under similar circumstances, we said, and how, how do you deal with them? And do we write them a one-off report Shouldn't we be looking this globally? The final point that I'll make is, and it's been touched upon, the local municipalities may see it differently than the region does, and how do I marry those two? So just some concerns going forward in terms of maybe is there a better way to package this so that everybody's in the tent? Because I think Councillor DeMarillo raises some very valid points. This is not going to go away today. In fact, others, I'm certain, will be coming. How do you want to deal with them? I think it should be with a holistic policy, but for what that's worth, I wanted to pass that on. My list is Raz Carlson, Mayor Brown. Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I do appreciate the deputants or the previous deputants that came uh, from the uh, Coptic or Orthodox Church, um, and, and I respect everybody's opinion here. That the, the challenge I find, and I sit on audit and risk for both the city and the region, is, is the precedent this sets. And I know I'm not one for looking to say, okay, are there ways around this? But there were so many instances over the last few years when uh, places of worship have come to the city of Mississauga and asked for, um, asked for certain dispensations with respect to development charges. I think we've taken the approach that uh, where we don't put development charge credit or development charges on the places of worship, um, the main places of worship, that this sets the bar for fairness. And to go beyond that, um, I think, puts us in a very, very difficult situation for what's going to come forward. So um, it's, it's, we live in a world of unintended consequences. I can assure you that this will not be a one-off, that, uh, that our other um, religious institutions within the region of Peel are going to become, are going to come forward. We have uh, quite a few that are in the process of being built in the city of Mississauga. And we, as th this cannot go on the back, uh, back of property taxpayers. If there's other opportunities for these organizations to, to fundraise, to make additional monies in, these, uh, in the uh, daycare or renting out their facilities, they have those options to pay that down over time. I think um, there's a certain level of unfairness by doing this as a one-off and that doesn't meet our bylaw. So uh, unfortunately, I'm unable to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, here we go. Uh, I'm taking a, a kind of a contrary view for, on two points. Number one, precedent isn't a bad thing to set if your precedent is showing compassion and recognizing circumstances that were perhaps beyond the control of the applicant. So for me to exercise judgment once every year or two on something like this is 
probably one of the reasons why we got elected to do it, so I have no problem with doing that whatsoever. Secondly, when I hear the story of getting caught up in the myriad of heritage, I know a lot about that, a lot more about that than I know about the tax laws of Ontario. Uh, that can be a quagmire that, and, and quite often routinely is, it not can be, it's, it's never easy. It's almost like a different body within a city. The heritage group do not have a whole lot of regard by law for whether the city likes it or not. In fact, we're, it's part of our mandate is to make decisions as a quasi-judicial body about the merits of a building, whether the homeowner or the property owner likes it, quite often against their will, mostly against their will. So when you have a property like this and you want to do anything with it, uh, the binders that get dropped off at your front door from the government here to help to get you through uh, uh, what you can do with a heritage building uh, I think I'd waive, I think I'd pay the first one-third of their construction costs just to avoid the, 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 so it's the cost that we pay to preserve heritage, just look at it that way. This is really a bill against the Heritage Department to uh, the division to make sure something like this can go ahead. So they have my uh, complete empathy. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're quite right too, in the long term, we need to look, now, perhaps all these groups, we just did it for the Luso charity back in Mississauga there a week or two ago, waiving their part of their tax bill so that they can have a more affordable operation. Uh, I think it was unanimous vote at the city to, yeah. was, uh, was it, wasn't, there was one, okay. All right. Well then, uh, would you like to identify which councillor it might have been? Uh, oh, okay, okay, very good. So at any rate, uh, that's, that was an individual job. I struggle with that quite a bit because really they get a discount already on their taxes. They get a residential rate instead of commercial. So I was kind of wondering about, you know, how far do we go? So at any rate, I, I came to the conclusion that the, the social work that was done for the public at an extremely low cost for a group of people who aren't well served by the province in that they're a little bit older, they're not little kids, they're older, uh, young adults mostly. So it, they made a case on the merits. I think you're hearing that here today. There are fair, um, a lot of merits to this case. Uh, I don't have any problem going forward. I sometimes think, thinking of all the good work that places of religious assembly do for youth and so on, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to maybe uh, devising a different charge system within the law to recognize that. But in the meantime, these guys want to get on with their job over here, I'm assuming. Uh, they don't want to wait for the government to study this for a year or two. So I'm inclined to they support my friends from, Cal, or from uh, well, Calvin too, but also uh, from Brampton in this particular case uh, and uh, give, give the exemption that they're looking for. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, George. My last two speakers are Councillor Starm Brown. Oh, I have Councillor Dask. Then I'll carry on with it. I was going to have Count Mayor Brown speak last as the mover of the motion, but I'll carry on as presented. Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And one of the reasons um, that I believe we shouldn't delay this until we have a full report studying uh, religious institutions is this simply isn't um, about uh, um, a blanket policy. This is unique. This is a unique situation. Um, this is a situation where they were doing the city of Brampton and the region of Peel a favor, taking uh, a, a shack on their property, um, and then finding out afterwards uh, that the bill associated with it, they thought they were just going to be, there's no cost, and they find out that the bill is going to be 550000 550000 So the church had raised all this money to... Um, through their efforts to be able to build a recreation center for the community. Uh, and, and then they find out that all the money they raised for the recreation center is going to go essentially to the favor that they did the region and the city. Now, obviously, that caused years of delay and fighting, and uh, frankly, they almost gave up. Uh, we managed to uh, find a solution thanks to the leadership of, of Councillor Downey in uh, Caledon. Um, and now they realized that the, the development charges have gone up significantly since they first embarked on us. And Councillor Pileshi, he helped too. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Um, a bit. You connected them with Councillor Downey. Um, and so the development charges since they started this process went up. And so all they're saying is, let's go back to the starting point when they had built their capital campaign. They had made a pitch to their congregation. They had made a pitch to their community. These are the numbers. If we raise this, we can do it. And it puts them in an awkward position going back and saying, actually, because of these delays of government, because of this mess, we actually have to go back and raise all this again. They're still going to contribute $283,608 as they were told when this process started. And that's why it's unique. We bear some of this responsibility. Um, 
And I really, I know we're talking about uh, a different debate. When, we, when you get into whether recreation centers should be exempt like institutions of faith are, that's an entire, entirely different discussion. And we can, you know, municipalities don't pay development charges uh, on recreation centers. Uh, so if we were to do this on our own, you know, we would, the, the, the region wouldn't get it. If the city assumed it, the city, the region wouldn't get anything. And then the city would actually have to staff it. Now you've got a, a you've got a not-for-profit staffing it. And, but I think that debate should happen when we have a holistic approach to this. And, and I think there are arguments to be made on both sides of whether to do this or not to do this. I don't want to blur the debate about a unique anomaly here. This was a long delay because of government uh, uh, error, uh, because of uh, some responsibility of the region and the city of Brampton. Um, and so I would ask regional council's indulgence on this, given this is uh, unique. This doesn't happen very often. You, you don't see um, a, a religious institution doing a favor to the region and the city, um, and causing major delay for that um, generosity. Uh, and if that came up again, if, if there was a seven, eight year delay because of, the, that we contributed to, then I'd say yes, we should, we should show empathy in that scenario as well. And so I just, I'd ask uh, regional council to understand the uniqueness of this situation. Thank you. Councillor Starr. Well, I, I'm going to be brief. I, I think this is, uh, as, as already been stated, it is a one-off situation. This is not precedent setting because of the situation uh, that we've seen and heard about already. I think the history and the way they were delayed with the heritage situation, I'm not going to keep repeating that, but it is totally different. If we want to take a look at what the other uh, opportunities are, that should be done separately, and maybe a report should be coming forward. I can tell you that the last time we did something for the churches in Mississauga, um, I had the pleasure of trying to deliver a check back to one of the churches. And I, keyword trying, because they didn't cash it. They said, we, we paid our charges and uh, we're happy. But we said, no, no, you have to take this check. Well, they didn't take it. Anyway, uh, I, I just think that the, uh, the situation is totally, uh, totally different. Uh, I don't think it's going to uh, set a, a written in stone uh, precedent. Um, precedents are exactly that. Uh, it's for a particular situation, and, and there are always uh, reasons why there's um, compassion. I think the word Councillor uh, Carlson used and it's empathy. It's not sympathy. It's empathy saying, you're stuck in that position, so it's time to help you out. And, uh, and for the work that all the uh, uh, appeal or the Coptic churches, churches do in the GTA overall, and I can tell you the, the work that they do in uh, my particular ward and the rest of uh, Mississauga, um, they deserve this. This isn't a gift. They deserve to be treated properly uh, because I think they uh, didn't get the maybe the responses and didn't get the help they needed originally. This is the help they needed. They are paying development charges as originally um, uh, discussed. So I'm for this uh, 100%. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Councillor Dasko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask, I think some of this is around the precedent setting component. And I'm just asking this question because I, I just don't know the answer. Is a lot of the discussion here too is over uh, a heritage, uh, and Mr. Mayor Brown mentions a heritage shack, but uh, uh, just, a, just a heritage building itself. Uh, if we look at that, is it possible to have uh, this motion written that specifically identifies that so that it might limit the precedent setting component? And I don't know if. Uh, if, uh, if legal might be able to talk to that, if uh -oh. that's possible at all. And say I would take Perhaps, that yeah, the a, mover as, of the motion should yeah. speak. Mayor Brown? Just, I think that's a great friendly uh, amendment in light of the uniqueness. Just say, it could start off by saying, in light of the heritage delays that a grant. So, yeah, yeah. so something like that. Thank you. Through to staff, any thoughts on that? I think it's fair to say that anything that differentiates this from the run of development charge exemption applications at large is uh, helpful uh, to avoid precedent setting. And 
perhaps I'm being too long-winded about that, but the, 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 the unique circumstance that has been identified on the floor, uh, if uh, borne out, uh, would be a differentiation that would help to protect the grant as a unique circumstance. Thank you, Councillor Dasko. Anything further? You're good? Okay. Uh, Councillor Demerla. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my actually, uh, while the, I can understand the uh, logic behind the amendment, what I wonder is if we do this, the next time there is a delay on the part of the city of Brampton on any issue that can be said, well, it was the fault of the city council or uh, city officials, does this then create a defense for other people who can come forward and say, you know, you gave a break on the development charges because you acknowledged that the delay was on the side of the city, so now we would also like to go back to a lower rate, and that's a bigger uh, concern for me. If that if what I'm flagging is in fact true, it may not be, but that would be a concern for me because now we actually create a solid open and shut case where we say, if the city creates a delay, uh, then you can reasonably ask to go back to a date when city should have in the normal course given its consent. And we know that delays happen for many, many reasons. And... Um, I'm sure there are other cases where the city, different cities across Ontario have uh, perhaps given their dis decisions later than they should have. Patrick? Uh, it, it is fair to say that future applicants for exemption would be encouraged to advance an argument based on some perceived delay in the past. Um, the real question is what, what are the merits of that assertion that there was a delay, that the a municipality was at fault, and, and uh, that would have to be considered on its on its own merit. So, so I guess uh, I, I don't have enough understanding to know whether in this particular case it was the fault of the city of Brampton or the region of Peel. I'm not pointing fingers, but trying to get to understanding what is unique here. Were these delays normal delays, or was a real omission made? Uh, I mean, these are really, uh, I, I just feel like that's the challenge with these one-offs when they're not thought through because now we are going to create a whole new layer of uh, reasons why other organizations can come forward and seek an exemption. So this actually concerns me a little bit more. Thank you. Councillor Vicente. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with the sentiments uh, around the table that are supporting uh, this motion, uh, but I would just like to ask staff a question. If staff could just answer and detail um, what kind of assistance and partnership has uh, the church offered to the Region Appeal in the past with regards to some of the projects that the Region Appeal has had on or near this property? Through the chair, are you speaking specifically to the child care spaces? It is my understanding that um, the region appeal uh, and the church share a road, and that was an accommodation made by the church. And also that um, in the past, uh, according to um, the delegation from the uh, previous meeting, that uh, the church leadership had agreed to a recent request from the region appeal to utilize a portion of their land for a construction project. I'm going to look to my colleagues from Public Works. What we are aware of is a housing project that was uh, committed by the region back in 2007. Would that be what you were speaking to, Councillor? I'm not familiar with the project. No. That's why I'm asking for your clarification. Okay. Because I think this is material to this request. Uh, neither are we. I think we could find out pretty quickly as this debate continues. But that's news. That's a new one for me. Could we, per could we perhaps ask a representative from the church just to come forward and just to detail? 
So just to clarify, I do have the report from 2007 where we did commit $17 million to affordable housing. I'm just not aware of the piece related to the road. And the role of the church in facilitating that? Yeah. And Patrick, did, Patrick, did you have something further on that? I see you on my list. If I might just suggest, Mr. Chair, from a, from a purely legal perspective, uh, perhaps the most a potentially defensible way to deal with the matter would be to bring back a report, not uh, across the board about exemption of places of worship, but dealing with the unique circumstances of this particular uh, place of worship and the merits of the various considerations that have been put on the floor uh, around roads, uh, provision of daycare center space, the heritage issue, delays associated with it. These are things that uh, I think there's some confusion on the part of staff at the moment uh, with respect to those various considerations. Um, and if they are to form the basis for the grant, uh, just from a purely legal perspective and perhaps from a practical one, uh, it may be advisable to bring forward that kind of report. The reason why I ask is because when we talk about the delays that the church has been experiencing, they're both for regional and for municipal um, causes. And so the church has been very willing to work with the municipality. And so this request uh, simply acknowledges that they had to do their construction project in phases. And so their request to have the DCs applied at the previous rate I think is reasonable and I would be willing to support it. Thank you. That exhausts my list and I thank you all for a very sincere and intense conversation on the matter. That brings me to the motion that you have before you moved by Mayor Brown and Councillor Starr. I will take it as read and I need a recorded vote at this time, please. And congratulations to the church. That motion carries. Thank you. All right. With that, we move on with the rest of the agenda. Other business notices, a motion I'll deal with. Sorry, I'm a page ahead of myself. Let me get back to staff presentations. There are none. Items related to public works. Councillor Groves, if I am correct, I know you're the chair, but the only items noted were ones that you noted that you might like to speak to. So I, perhaps appropriately, I will turn the floor over to Vice Chair Fortini so that you're at complete liberty to speak to all the matters. Is that appropriate? So Vice Chair Fortini, if you could take the role of chair for items related to public works uh, that I believe Councillor Groves will be speaking to. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is something I think uh, in that year the chair pulled out. It's a 9.3. Uh, I'm bringing forward also 9.1 uh, uh, and also 10.2. It's uh, so it's for a bylaw for the regional road highway 50, Queen Street regional and ward road nine. Sorry, King King Street 50 meters north of Mill, Town of Kelvin ward five. So I see uh, uh, that <coughs> Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just going to actually give a, a little bit of highlight or history on this issue. Um, I, this is obviously this is in my ward. This has been a, an issue in my ward for all the years that I sat on council. I've been a member of the business improvement area. Um, we've had lots and lots of discussion on this topic. Um, it, it, and I can tell you, we had all day parking on Queen Street and Caledon Council back in the day, a, year, a few years ago, changed that because they recognized that we don't have the infrastructure in place that we need in order to move people um, uh, through the community. And so Caledon Council a few years ago implemented a parking restriction in downtown Bolton. That parking restriction is on the west side of the road. Um, there's a restriction between 6 and 9 a.m. And on the 
on the east side of the road is a restriction between 4 and 7 p.m. The reason why we did that at the time in, in Caledon is because it allows the residents who live on the North Hill to move, uh, to get to work and move smoothly through traffic rather than through gridlock. Um, staff here did have a public consultation meeting in August of last year with my community. Um, and Mr. Avsek can um, speak to this or confirm that the room, I think we had over 120 people in that room. I think we heard maybe two people who spoke in favor of all day parking and the rest of the community was completely against it. We also heard, and I'm sure Mr. Avsek has got a lot of emails that he's received from my residents in opposition to this. We have a traffic issue in Bolton right now because we just don't have all the infrastructure in place. We are working through some of these things through the Bolton Transportation Master Plan, which recognizes active transportation, cycling, that sort of thing. And, and um, both the regional staff and our staff in Caledon are working very actively on that in implementing some of those active tran uh, transportation and other things in Bolton. And I want to thank the region for the work that they have done in downtown Bolton to address some of the issues we're having. However, if you drive through my community and you get there at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you will see that the traffic is already backed up without the all-day parking in place. I know that the region implemented the CCTV cameras and I know that they've been monitoring this and I can confirm that my conversation with staff does confirm that at this moment we do have a traffic issue and it does back traffic up. Our traffic is backed up quite a bit without this all day parking. We did hear from when this came to council, um, I believe in September of last year, a report came to this council based on the feedback received from the public consultation meeting with the community in August, that Caledon Council was to have um, consultation with the community addressing the concerns that were raised in the August, uh, August 8th meeting. I believe it was on August 8th, August 9th meeting. Caledon Council did not, did not communicate with the community based on the concerns they raised in that meeting of last August. Instead, council went ahead and passed a resolution with no consultation with my community whatsoever to implement this all day parking. We do have a, a few people downtown that has been lobbying. They've been lobbying um, council for a couple of years now to implement this and, 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 and hence, this is where it is. And in fact, this morning driving here, I had to take an Uber here, and the Uber driver lives in, on the North Hill in Bolton, and he was raising that concern. He says, if you guys implement this, traffic is gonna be backed up even further south, all the way to Queensgate, which is really south, and frustration, people are getting frustrated and what's going to happen is that traffic is going to divert into other neighborhoods. And I know that the report speaks to this about the, the concern about traffic diverting into other neighborhoods. Hence, it's a domino effect and it's a snowball effect where then I'm going to get calls from those people in the other neighborhoods saying, get this traffic out of here. Both myself and the local councillor have heard We've had a flood of uh, social media activity against this all-day parking. Um, it's my job to represent my constituents. Um, and, and the fact that both myself and the area councillor, Council Rosa, who sent an email to the clerk, um, uh, Yes, he did send an email saying he was in opposition to this as well, based on the feedback that we received from our constituents. The OPP also wrote a report, and they had, they had a, a correspondence item in our agenda when we, when we tabled this in Caledon, and they had concerns, and they didn't think that this was a solution. In fact, they believe that the frustrated drivers will become more aggressive and will have more issues in downtown Bolton. Now, some folks are using who are in favor of this accidents that's happened in downtown Bolton. Those accidents are not related to this at all. 
these accidents are happening in the intersection and it's not related to this at all. I was quite disappointed in our OPP because when it came back two weeks later for a vote in the council meeting, the OPP watered down what was a very, um, uh, their first piece of correspondence was, was quite clear on their opposition to having all day parking. Two weeks later, another piece of correspondence came which was a very little wording on there saying, oh, well, you know, it, it might not be such a bad idea. It is a bad idea for my community. And if you live in Bolton, and if you live on this north hill of Bolton, and if you travel that way, you would understand. It's been an issue for years. We built the Emil Cole Parkway. Yes, some traffic has diverted there. We're asking traffic to divert on another road, the Albion Vaughan Road. Well, I've got all those residents who back onto the Albion Vaughan Road saying, we got issues here. The noise level is crazy, and Caledon did confirm that the noise level is way above standard, ministry standard. So I've got issues over there with those residents, and now we're trying to force this upon all the other residents who are against it. Now, the, the, the ironic thing with this is we're talking about all-day parking so that people can shop downtown Bolton. Well, the irony in all of this is saying to our residents who would normally travel through the core and stop at the stores and stop at the businesses, that we're telling them, we don't want you stopping here. We want you to go on the Emil Cole um, bypass and bypass all the businesses here and not just the businesses in downtown Bolton but bypassing those businesses on the South Hill of Bolton. So I don't understand why we have this recommendation in front of us when my community is clearly, clearly against it. We heard from, uh, we've heard delegations in Caledon, and I'm sure that all of us have those emails that residents have been sending. I understand there's the petition here, but I can tell you that 97% of my community does not support this. This is an issue I have been dealing with for years and years and years, being uh, a counselor in, in, in Bolton. So I'm asking that Regional Council consider the fact that both councillors who represent the ward are not in support of this because our residents are completely against it. We do have to address some of the issues in downtown Bolton and we are doing so. But right now what I see this as, it's a political decision it is a Band-Aid solution. It is not a solution that's going to solve the problem in downtown Bolton. Downtown Bolton needs a ton of work. We are working on, on some of that and, and trying to revitalize downtown. And if parking is an issue, which it is not, because there are plenty of parking spots downtown Bolton, which we spent money to create a, a municipal parking lot to add those parking spots years ago, just people don't want to walk. They want to park right there and get there and they don't want to walk. And, and another important thing to note is that we have our fire hall downtown Bolton. Those firefighters, they, they actually have a number of parking spots designated to them. Now with them leaving, which they should be leaving shortly, moving into our new fire hall, those parking spots will, is, will now become available to the public that they can use it. So this is not an issue of, oh, we want all day parking back because we want people to shop here, stop here, and shop here. We're not asking people to stop there. We're asking them to go on the west side of the road and bypass all of the businesses. So, I'm actually quite disappointed to see the recommendation before us, given the fact that on August 9th, 2018, at that public meeting, the outcry from the public that they do not want this, and the fact that the report, I believe, was 10.4, that was before this council on September 13, 2018, clearly said Staff are deferring this decision based on the feedback they got on the August 9th meeting 
from the residents who were in attendance at that meeting, they were deferring it to Caledon to consult with the community. Members of council, there was no consultation with my community. Absolutely none. Caledon Council instead chose to pass this bylaw, force it down the throats of my residents, and all of the after effects and impacts, I'm gonna have to deal with it, and so will Councillor Rosa. And I think that the ward councillors certainly know their community. I have lived in the community for years, so, does, so has Councillor Rosa. I have represented this community for years. I have dealt with this issue for years, and we still don't have the infrastructure in place that we need in order to implement this all day parking. Right now what we have, we've got bits and pieces here and there of the puzzle, but this is not a holistic approach. This is a Band-Aid solution. This is an approach that is gonna create chaos in my community. I thank the region that we passed the restriction in, in downtown Bolton with the trucks that has certainly helped downtown Bolton. However, this will not, because we are not, Caledon Council did not look at the community as a whole. I represent not just downtown Bolton, but I represent the community as a whole. It is my responsibility, it is my obligation to my entire community to make sure that I look at things objectively and find solutions for everybody. And if we look, we can find those solutions because they are available. However, this has become very political and we all know what happens with political decisions. People get hurt. And that, I am extremely disappointed in this recommendation. I will not be supporting it. I will be supporting my residents and their safety. And certainly, I don't want it to be made that, because that's what will be said on social media, is that Councillor Groves doesn't support safety downtown Bolton. I support safety downtown Bolton. I support keeping all of my residents safe. And again, I, OPP clearly stated that all day parking will be a huge safety issue in downtown Bolton based on aggressive driving. driving. So I'm hoping and I'm asking that members of regional council consider the fact that I've put before them, the fact that the two members of council that represent that ward are not in support. We have to take all of the complaints. We get the brunt of it from our constituents. That's all I'm going to say, and I hope that I've been able to provide some clarity and, and some helpful insight on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Innes. Thank you, Vice Chair Fortini. Um, like all communities, when they're older and they need to be revitalized, you have to create plans on how to revitalize those communities. We've done it through many of our villages and hamlets all throughout the entire region of Peel. Um, for those new councillors that don't know, I've been involved in this process since 2004 when I was the Chief of Staff for Mayor Morrison at the Town of Caledon. So I've been involved in this process for a very long time as well. And while I may not represent the area uh, right downtown in Bolton, I represent the area, a piece of Bolton, and all around Bolton. So this is very important to my residents as well. But back to the revitalization of the communities. There's a process to do that. We went through to the region of Peel, who created, with in partnership with the town of Caledon, a Bolton transportation master plan. And in there, there was various steps of what we needed to do to make the traffic flow and to be safe and to help revitalize that core area. 
Councillor Groves referred to the fact that when we did have all day parking there, that it was a problem. Yeah, it was because the Emil Cole Parkway, which is the bypass around Bolton, wasn't open. It's open now. We opened it. And the first thing that we did after we opened it, thank you to Councillor Groves, was putting a motion forward to get the trucks out of the downtown core so that it is more pedestrian and active transportation friendly. That's now been done as well, thank you to this council. The next step in that Bolton Master Plan Transportation Study is all day street parking in Bolton. It's not a Band-Aid solution. It's multiple pieces coming together that we have skilled engineers and staff working on. There's emergency responses involved. I have, I have reports from, from uh, whether or not it's our emergency services of paramedics, our OPP, our fire, that all agree with the pilot program. And the reason they agree with the pilot program is because it's part of the Bolton Master Plan study, because they think that they can work through it, because we need to do something. The status quo in this area is not working. There are accidents almost every week at this location. There are cars and buses and trucks going up onto the sidewalk. There are, we want to talk about the public meeting that was held last August. Let's talk about the public meeting that was held last August. There was 120 people there. Only two spoke out against. It was the worst public meeting I have ever attended as an elected official in my entire life. I actually messaged our staff here to apologize because the behavior was inappropriate. I had numerous residents who were speaking in favor of all day parking who left. They felt intimidated and uncomfortable, so they left. That should never happen. That shouldn't happen in any community, in any public meeting. And those residents, in turn, started emailing and phone calling all of us, which is their right to do. Furthermore, we received a, a petition that I think is attached. That petition was collected in five days. Five days, somebody went out and collected signatures. There's 87 signatures in support, all from the Bolton area. The BIA, which was referenced, the Bolton uh, Business Improvement Area, they support all day parking in the down core area. This is not just about parking to support businesses. This is about parking to slow down the traffic, the traffic calming initiative so that pedestrians feel comfortable walking on their sidewalks. There's restaurants, there's, there's um, an ice cream parlor that people don't even wanna take their kids and sit out on the sidewalk because they're afraid a car or a truck is gonna mount the sidewalk and kill them. This is not okay. All we're asking is let's do a study. Let's collect the data and make a good decision in 12 months. We're not saying let's implement all day parking here today, now in perpetuity. We're saying let's get the data so that we can make a better decision. I'm supporting the staff recommendation and I will ask staff um, with regards to the, um, the implementation of the, um, the pilot is this or is this not part, or has this not always been part of the Bolton Transportation Master Plan? Yeah, yeah, as part of that, through you, Mr. Chair, yeah, it's part of the uh, Bolton Transportation Master Plan to uh, pilot uh, all-day parking. And have any of our emergency services said that this is a bad idea and that we should not be doing this pilot program, that they have uh, you know, issues of concerns of safety of our residents? I believe um, through OPP, they had some issues with respect to um, congestion and aggressive driving and road rage. And what will we be doing to encourage our residents to actually take the bypass that travel from the North and the South Hills, that it actually is faster if you take the bypass as opposed to driving through the downtown core? What are we doing to encourage them as a means to take that bypass? Uh, well, if, if, if this, um, if we go through with, with this pilot project, we're gonna put out a, um, uh, a news release to advise of, of the changes. We're also gonna post uh, variable message signs out on Highway 50 advising of this uh, coming to fruition. So 
I know that Councillor Groves and I are on opposite sides of this, and, and when it comes to the Bolton community, we usually work pretty closely together to help make things happen. We're on opposite ends because we have a different point of view about what's going to happen in the history. I'm asking my colleagues around this table to think about the fact that to make good decisions, we need the data to do it. This is a pilot program to get the data. We may get the data, and in 12 months, we may be sitting around this table saying, all day parking doesn't make sense. Or we may get it and say, it needs to be, it, it needs to continue and not be a pilot. But let's get that data, because right now, the status quo is not working. The accidents aren't working. The people that live in that downtown core are not happy. So let's get the information, let's make our decisions based on that information. I'm relying on the, the report that the staff have brought together, the Bolton Transportation Master Plan, which had numerous public consultation opportunities. Um, it's not new to our community. This community has been, has been dealing with this issue for years now. Um, this vote at our town council was seven to two. And if this vote was taken in the previous term, it may have been different because the area councillor who served that term previously supports the all-day parking. In fact, he's been one of the largest advocates as somebody who is very uh, into active transportation and very in tune with his community. He supports the all-day parking. And he has written numerous times and been working with staff on that initiative to move it forward as well. The idea is a fully completed, implemented Bolton Transportation Master Plan. And the only way that that can happen is if we take the steps in that plan to achieve those goals. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dowley. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I, I too support the recommendation, and Councillor Groves mentioned that if we look, we will find the solution. Um, I don't want to uh, belabor this. What I might suggest that is that this is the looking. We need to get the data. We need to figure out how it works. We need that information, and as Councillor Inish men mentioned, in 12 months, we may come back to the table and maybe we were wrong, but maybe we were right. So we need to do that work in order to find it and, and there's in, you can't just move forward with nothing. So in order to find the answer and come to that solution that we're looking for, we need to do the work. And I propose that this is the work. Um, and it may come with some bumps and bruises and it may come with some extra communication to your community. Nobody around this table is a stranger to being lobbied from one side or the other. We all get it. Um, but we have to, that's, it's incumbent upon us to share that information and do our best with our communities to explain the situation, explain why we're doing the work, and knowing that we're ultimately looking for a better solution for the downtown core. Um, Born and raised, downtown Bolton. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful village. Um, it has a lot to offer, but we can do better, and we need to do the work in order to do better. Councilor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff. The accidents have been referenced. Can you tell me, do you have, a, is there, were these accidents related to speed? The, the accidents that we have uh, recorded um, through our uh, collision database, I don't think we could specifically attribute, attribute them to speed. Thank you. Speeding is what some are saying is a, is a, is a problem. And I can tell you that the accidents that, were, that happened, I was right there. A truck lost, it, the, the brakes malfunctioned on the truck and there was an accident with the truck. The other accidents that happened, people were cutting each other off in the intersection. That's why those accidents are happening. It's driver behavior. It's mechanical failure on a truck. This can happen anywhere. Drivers are cutting each other off all the time, everywhere. So this has got nothing to do with um, speeding in downtown. In fact, we've done a lot of work thanks to this region. We put in uh, crosswalks down there. We've, we've uh, reduced the speed limit down there. So we have been doing things to address this. And through you, Mr. Chair, to staff, we have those, you, you implemented those CCTV cameras. And from your observation, there are from time to time people do park there when during the time that it's restricted. What sort of, 
Did you notice any traffic backlog? Did, did you notice anything there? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, if there's somebody parked in, in those lanes during the peak periods where we currently have uh, restrictions, um, yeah, it causes uh, significant congestion. That is my point. We don't even have this in place, but when someone happens to park there, it is causing, as staff said, significant congestion. Guess where that congestion is going? In the other neighborhoods around the area. And guess what? Then they're gonna have some concerns in that neighborhood. So the fact that Caledon Council had absolutely no consultation or community engagement after that August 9th meeting. This shouldn't even have come before Caledon Council, and this shouldn't be here. And I fully support the Bolton Transportation Master Plan because a lot of work went into that, both with the region and the town, and it's a great plan. However, all the things that's in there, we don't have the infrastructure. We are missing bits and pieces of infrastructure in Bolton. Why? Because we don't have the dollars to build it. When we have all of that infrastructure in place, in my opinion, that's when we need to start looking at downtown Bolton. We are right now in, a, in the process working with our staff, and Councillor Innes is working with me on it, um, and the mayor, in looking at revitalizing downtown Bolton. This is not the solution to revitalizing downtown Bolton. This is not, these accidents that people are saying, it's not related to speed. We need to invest in downtown Bolton. We need to put more people in Bolton. And so, I have a concern when the people speak, and yeah, I was at that meeting, and yeah, people were not happy, because we were trying to force something down their throats. That's what they were not happy about. We've all been in residence meeting where it gets a little heated. That's not uncommon. But I will tell you, my community does not support this. This is piecemealing. This is not a holistic approach to finding those solutions. And I can tell you, Data is, has been collected. Data is available through the CCTV cameras that staff has on Highway 50 showing the impact and the congestion on Highway 50 if people are parked there when they're not supposed to be parked there. So that tells you, and I can tell you, and again, go back to the OPP, their first report that they submitted where they are very concerned about all day parking. Thank you. Councillor Russ. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'm not too sure why this comes as a surprise because there is the resolution that was passed to the town of Caledon on May 30th. So obviously it had to come back to the region appeal. I'm happy to move a motion to download this whole section of road back to Caledon because it seems like you're rehashing everything that happened at the town, town of Caledon. Yeah. So if anybody wants to second that, that's fine. Um, but, uh, you know, this at the end of the day, this is a pilot. Municipalities make changes, whether it's speed bumps, stop signs. I had a at the city of Mississauga the other day, they accidentally put in the stop sign in the wrong place. I'm dealing with a whole host of poop right now. Um, but but I think that conversation needs to stay at the local level. So on this particular one, the region needs, needs to take a higher level. I know it's a regional road. Maybe we can just download this section so you can deal with it at the town of Caledon. Councillor Carlson. That's what I like to call a damn good idea. Oh, but wait. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm listening. Honest guy, I try to be a, a fair guy. I think yeah. I think I'm reasonable. I can't figure this out at all. Now the only thing I have in common with them is I've got Queen Street and Streetsville, and everything you've tried and done. I think I've tried and done. I've been around so long. I've, I'm back to doing it over again, because paid parking, no paid parking, one way, this way, don't go that way. Well, to one hour parking on Queen Street, you can't get your hair done in an hour. I found out the hard way. So we had to change that pretty quick to two hours. So. I, I really, I, I, early on, I, uh, I, I promised Ned I was going to support her, and I, I'd, I'd like to support you, but 
I can, for the life of me, I can't figure out who's right. And, and the mayor's not here. I'd like to hear why he didn't have a meeting for, if he didn't, for the, the 120 people that were pretty, well, I was going to use a bad word, uh, angry. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, if you move the motion to send it back to Calvin, I'd be quite happy to support you. The whole, every, everything associated, because I, I don't really want to pick between no, the two. Yeah. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, it, they both sound right. So I, I don't know what the hell to think of it. So uh, I'll leave it at that for now. And the board gets bigger. Councillor Grove again. Thank you. And to your point, Councillor Raz, last we are in the time. process of working on downloading that section of road. Um, <laughs> In, and we're doing looking at a trade-off. So that's actually been in process now for probably two years. Um, so we are looking at it because it is problematic. And I, I'm going to tell you, but I, like I said, when you've got staff here at the region who has been completely <coughs> fair through the process, asking Kaladin to engage and consult with the community based on a meeting where nobody wanted this parking. Caledon Council did not. I would hope, and I would, it, would, it, was, it would have been my hope that we would have another meeting with our residents based on the feedback we received from them before passing a motion in Caledon Council to do this. Community engagement is key. We heard this morning from the delegate here, from the, uh, with the Coptic Church and the, 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 the involvement in the community, how they work with the community and what we're doing to work with the community. That's why we're elected. We are elected to listen and to work with people, not just let it fall on deaf ears. All of those concerns that were raised last August fell on deaf ears with Caledon Council because there was no consultation and Councillor Carson, I can confirm that. Absolutely no consultation with my community. Instead, we just forced it upon them. Councillor Ennis. I guess my question to staff is, in the Bolton Transportation Master Plan, was it not originally that there was no pilot. It was just to implement all day parking in Bolton. Yeah, I, I believe it speaks to implementation of all day parking. Correct. And so what we did as a council and with the leadership of Mayor Thompson, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but the vote was 7-2, the mayor supports this, unequivocally supports this, is say, let's do a pilot program Let's not fully implement all day parking. Let's try this for 12 months. Let's get the data so then we can make a final decision based on data. And that data is gonna be a wide range of things. It's going to be the traffic, the speed, the, the volume, the number of accidents, the number of routes that they're gonna take, you know, the shortcuts instead, the number of volume on the bar. We're actually even gonna, we've asked to look at things like um, interact transactions in our, in our businesses to see if there's been an increase in business, an increase in pedestrians, an increase in active and cycling transportation. Let's just get the data. Council, Caledon Council took a step back and said, we're not asking you to implement it. We're not asking you to implement it permanently. Let's do a 12 month pilot program, which is fully supported by staff that are sitting here today. The recommendations are before you from staff. They have no political will in this or stake whatsoever. They're saying here, let's do a 12 month pilot so that we have the information to make the best decision. Their job is to get us the information so that we can make the best decision around this table. I'm, I'm not gonna belabor it anymore. I'm just asking for 12 months so we can get the data, so we can make the best decision for our residents. Thank you. Councillor Zermerla. Thank you, Chair. I, I um, feel the same way as Councillor Carlson and Councillor Raz in terms of feeling fairly inadequate uh, to weigh in on this. It's a very local issue. So I wanted to know, I know that downloading the the road is can't be done today, but can, can council say that this decision should not be made here, that it's just, I mean, instead of downloading the entire road, can we vote on something that says this is just a local issue? The CAO can address that. 
it requires a change in the regional bylaw because it's a regional road. That's why it's here. Councillor Della. Sorry, just to, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Councillor Groves. Um, it's just a pilot that's coming back, is that correct? And so if we allow the pilot to come back and so uh, we can make an informed decision after that, no? Um, can I? Yes. Just saying, so the concern that the community has is it comes as a pilot, pilot comes back, it gets recommended that, oh, this is a great idea. And again, community is, but you know, Caledon is putting the cart before the horse. We're talking about data. We should have had those measurables in place before making a recommendation. We did not have those measurables in place. So, sorry, so the measurables or the data, that would be a decision by council to go ahead with that. And so um, I think that's what is being asked now to get that information now, is that correct? They are asking to collect data, but I can tell you, Councillor Dillon, staff has data here that they have seen through the cameras that they installed on the highway. Right, right. So, so what addition, can you just confirm what additional data will be uh, study, or sorry, to staff, what additional data uh, are we going to be getting from this new pilot? Um, we're going to look at um, before and after traffic volumes in the downtown. We're going to look at before and after uh, data on the Amal Cole Parkway. We're going to be looking at uh, speeds. We're going to be looking at uh, how large, we're looking at the existing queuing through the downtown. And once we implement the all day parking, how much larger that queuing will be, um, uh, the number of uh, collisions, uh, the number of pedestrians, some of like the increase in, in, in pedestrians downtown and active transportation. So, so will, the, will the concerns of the, uh, of the public, the residents also be addressed uh, as well? The so particular concerns that they do have. It, it depends on what concerns they have. So whatever, whatever the input was from the public meeting, like those specifics as to what Councillor Groves is talking about? The, the public had a, a number of, a number of different concerns with respect to um, mostly with, with, with the increased amount of, of congestion. So by us looking at that, we'll be able to give them what it is today and what it will be. So those types of uh, things that they were looking or interested in, we should have they'll, answers They'll be addressed for it. in the report. Yeah. Um, you know, Councilor Groves, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a pilot project. There's data that's going to be back. Um, and so um, I'll let, the dis I'll let uh, my colleagues, uh, I'll listen to their comments. Councilor Pelesci. Call the question. Councilor Madero's. Well, actually, no, we have to vote to off the board. Good. All the speakers are gone. Call the question. The call the question yeah. votes requires yeah. a two thirds. Yeah. There's 19 present, so we'll need 13. And just show of hands. Uh, show if I may, hands. through the chair, yeah. but I think, Councilor Madero, so have you voluntarily taken yourself off the list? So if you have, Madam Clerk, is it appropriate then that we don't need the vote because there's no other speakers to there's the vote? No is that correct? So we're good to go just on a regular vote, I think, if That's the chair right. would call it. So I'll well, just vote uh, just on the report. All in favor of the report? No. Oh. Recorded vote? Recorded vote? Yeah, okay. So. You can, and the clerk tells me that it carries in a recorded vote of. Can you give the numbers? Uh, yep, 11 in favor. It's, it should be 
Oh, and everybody can see it quite clearly. Very good. It carries. Okay. Thank you. Pass it back to you, the Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we're on item 11, items related to health. Before I throw it over to Councillor Downey as Chair, I'd be remiss if I didn't on behalf of my colleagues and on behalf of your constituents, Councillor Downey, just uh, recently with all the tumultuous things going on with health and the province and the downloading, because we don't have a formally constituted Board of Health here at the region, that responsibility falls to the Chair and I spent some time on conference calls with the other 35 agencies. And then ALPHA, the Association of Local Public Health Agencies, had their major meeting in Kingston to deal with all of this. It was a four-day meeting and I was immersed with items related to the FCM, governance issues, et cetera, et cetera. And then I also had to tell myself, I don't know about any better than Councillor Downey to understand those issues better than I have because of all the great work she's done on the file over the years. And so I reached out to Councillor Downey and I thought, I thought it might be appropriate that in lieu of the chair, you attend as the chair of our health. And she stepped up and did just that. So apart from the great service she does for a constituency uh, and, and a woman with a husband and four children, went and did exemplary work for us and spent the four days at the conference and just did a marvelous job, far better than the chairman would have done. So I wanted to acknowledge you for what you've done and your constituents and your colleagues should know. With that, I turn over the health committee to Councillor Downey. Thank you, Chair Anika. It was uh, quite an eye-opening experience for me to attend Alpha um, with the um, uh, medical officers of health from across the province and getting a better understanding of how other municipalities operate under um, board structures for health. I think the biggest takeaway was um, how we represent ourselves as boards of health and how we represent public health as a whole across the province. The current government um, is trying to get patients out of hallways. Public health's mandate is to keep them from getting into the hallway in the first place. So I think that we as a whole um, can do a much better job of communicating that to our residents and really underlying the work that we do and how important public health, health is. Not many people realize that um, public health plays a role in every restaurant, every nail salon, every school, every uh, municipal building, there's a role to play there that keeps us healthy. It's just a very difficult role to measure. So um, that being said, I'll move on to um, our, sorry, those, those comments and um, recommendations are also reflected in the staff report coming forward. Um, so we'll move on to that. Sorry, item 11.2, that was passed on consent. I think it was passed on consent. So with, I, with that 11.1 review of Peel Regional Paramedic Service Divisional Model. And perhaps at the same time, Madam Chair, you can bring forward 20.1 uh, with regards to what Councillor Sinclair's concern was at the same time. Okay. Do we have any speakers on the board? Go ahead, Karen Ross. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor. Thank you, Joanna Downey. Uh, <laughs> I've had way too much coffee and not enough food. Um, all right, so uh, uh, Council, uh, Commissioner Polsonelli, uh, I'm just wondering, for the, in the greater context of this divisional review model, how is that uh, aligned with the changes that were announced by the provincial government with the, the reduction in funding, but also is there, um, can this be the model going forward if we were to be part of a larger boundary expansion? Through the chair, thank you for your question, Councillor Raz. Absolutely. So what um, this review acknowledges, as well as the work that we've done over the last 10 years, is the divisional model is a fabulous way to operationalize and mobilize our staff. Um, it certainly does provide efficiencies as well. So in relation to our most recent funding announcement, where we are in a shortfall, a deficit, certainly this does help to some degree support efficiencies. Um, not in its entirety, and we have a, an accompanying report that speaks to that. Should this be a model for future across the province? Absolutely, that is certainly an opportunity. One that we're already seeing to date. I know I can look at um, Chief uh, Dundas no. in the audience. I was going to call him Chief Peter. <laughs> Chief Dundas in the audience, who would say that he is called upon on a regular basis um, from other services who are quite interested in the divisional model approach, uh, some of which have already started taking on some of that learning. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Councillor Sinclair. Thank you. I'd like to make a few comments regarding the report, please. Um, part of the divisional model is to have uh, the um, trucks move, particularly in Caledon, all the way down to Fern Forest, which is qu quite large distances. And uh, an issue that's been of concern up in Caledon with a, quite a number of residents has occurred me that there would be at some point at shift changes no trucks in Caledon. And uh, I think staff disagree with that particular viewpoint, but it's never been adequately explained yet to me and others. So I just, uh, certainly the report is a superb report and covers a lot of really important items for us, but that remains an outstanding issue in Caledon. And uh, certainly the map, uh, figure one, shows the very large distances required to be covered. I think uh, the report covers some other important issues that frankly should be come part of council advocacy to the province. And that uh, concerns uh, provincial data, which is mentioned on page 11.1-23, where staff have told us that uh, the ministry has often transferred, adjusted, updated data related to previous months in an unorganized, unscheduled manner, and at various times throughout the year. Well. You know, suddenly I'm saying, well, why aren't we managing our own data? And certainly this must be something that has to be cleared up. It must be time consuming for staff. And the other one that's chronic, and I can remember uh, being on an ambulance committee in a previous life on regional council, this uh, whole issue of uh, the dispatch, CACC, and uh, unnecessarily coding messages up to the worst category and um, outdated technology. I think we have to get involved in that because it must be a major cost center for us and misallocation of resources. So somehow we're going to have to request staff to inform us accurately in a report on those particular items so that we can make them a and advocacy items to the province. I had a couple of questions, again, that really matter for uh, the Northeast District, Fern Forest. And uh, the question is, the most urgent uh, level of transport patients, nicknamed SCA and CTAS, sudden cardiac arrest and most urgent level of transport. The question is, how have the uh, response times been determined at this time out of CAC? And another one would be, since the uh, divisional model has been implemented, has the status of code yellow improved in the Northeast District? And I can't determine that from this report. So those are some technical items that uh, perhaps uh, Chair uh, Hanika, that uh, through your good graces, you've convened a couple of uh, informal discussions. Uh, with I'm citizens. sorry. That, uh, with apologies, you'll still have the floor, and my apologies to the acting chair. I've been advised by the clerk that we don't have quorum, so I've got to oh. hold for a moment, and then I'll come. And sorry to interrupt the chair. Here we are. Madam Clerk, we are in order. Back to you, Councillor. Thanks for coming back, folks. <laughs> so, like, once again, the, uh, since the divisional model has been implemented, has the status of Code Yellow improved up in the Northeast District? And uh, the Code Yellow, as I understand it, means uh, only five units or less available to answer calls, and it's quite a vast area. So these are rather technical questions, and uh, I wouldn't expect staff to simply be able to give us clear 
precise technical responses. But uh, so that uh, are some of my concerns, and uh, I think as far as the report goes, it's a tremendous report. Thank you. Thank you. I need a mover and seconder for the report. Moved by Councillor Raz, seconded by Councillor Fonseca. All in favor? Recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 11.3, Peel Health Restructuring. Sorry, Public Health Downey, Restructuring. Councilor Downey, if I may, may interrupt, we, were, we had brought forward um, Oh, I'm sorry, the other item. Councilor item. motion, which if Councilor Sinclair is, is content with the report, it could just be moved for receipt as opposed to a uh, decision. That would be a good idea. I think we have some alternative means to inquire and solve the information problems. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Santos, move receipt of the motion. Does it need a seconder? Councillor Sinclair, all in favor, just a show of hands. Thank you. Okay. Item 11.3, Public Health Restructuring and Peel. Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And um, it was uh, it was an excellent report, and uh, I, I really encourage um, everybody to take a thorough look at it if they haven't had the opportunity. Um, and uh, I do have a motion that's been brought forward and uh, and prepared and seconded by Councillor Fonseca, especially related to where we need to go with our advocacy. For, uh, for Peel Health Services, certainly we're at a critical mass in our um, population that um, uh, being part of a much larger group with very, very different community needs uh, will only be watered down. So um, I would uh, hope you support that the, um, uh, the motion's in front of you, but it's the first time. I'll give you a few seconds to take a look at it. Just the last paragraph, uh, essentially that we're, what we were looking at doing with respect to development charges is a similar communications campaign be developed and implemented um, to have Peel residents understand, understand the scope of public health programs. I know we heard a lot about what Toronto was doing, and we were as equally as impacted, but I think due to our, our lack of media campaign, we need to make that extra effort to do a grassroots campaign. Uh, so happy to move the motion, Madam Chair, and thank you with uh, certainly with your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Just really briefly, I was just going to highlight, sure, excellent, excellent report by staff, and I support the motion, and in particular to Councillor Rass's point, the importance of uh, educating and making sure that the public is aware of the, the um, range or the scope of the public health programs and services, I think, is, is essential. So happy to support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Innes. Thank you, um, and I like the addition. I think that's a great addition to the, the recommendations within the report. The only thing that I, I would add or suggest is um, we really need to ensure that our MPPs actually know what's happening and how this is impactful. And now that we have two members in cabinet, um, I think that uh, we should be making a strong effort, even through the chair or the government relations committee, that we are engaging. It may be difficult to get them all together at once because it's summer break, um, but as the chair of government relations, I'm willing to, to make the time to actually sit down um, with them to make sure that they have a clear understanding um, as we are rolling out our advocacy because I think we need them to be champions for the communities that they represent as well. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, um, Madam Chair. I support 
the motion and in particular the communications part that Councillor Raz has added. Um, the City of Brampton, we have our own health care advocacy campaign currently on the ground right now and I would suggest to staff as well um, at the region that we go heavy on social media on this one. Um, if we can with shareables and everything else uh, to inform the public the importance of our um, Peel Public Health. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, moved by Councillor Raz, seconded by Councillor Fonseca. All those in favor? Recorded. That carries, thank you. Items 11.4, Provincial 2019 Budget Announcements, Implications for Paramedic Services. Do we have quorum? And as my colleagues come back, if I may, um, there's that unwritten rule that if you're number 13, you never leave. <laughs> so if you might take a head count as you're having to run for a phone call or whatever, if you can just take that moment to make sure that there's still 13 warm bodies left behind, then go ahead. But otherwise, please stay on our time at number 13 or less. Thank you. Carrying on. Thank you. Item 11.4, Provincial 2019 Budget Announcements. Um, implications for paramedic services, Councillor Raz. Uh, I did hold this. Um, I don't know if anybody else needs to speak to it, but my questions were answered before. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, uh, we'll move by Councillor Raz, seconded by Councillor Mahoney. All those in favor, record a vote. That carries and that concludes the health section. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that brings me all the way down to other business. Do any other members have business before the chair? I will take this opportunity to speak to just one. Uh, I know you're all very interested in our works at the Peel Regional Police Services Board and our efforts to try and find a new chief. Um, just last week as chair, I met with our Peel Regional Police Association and the senior officers and in fairness to them, and I told them I would respond accordingly. A bit of concern that it's taken as long as it's taken in some regards to, to not bring the chief forward. But I wanted to be very clear on the reasons why. Uh, first of all, as you know, for individuals or citizens appointments and it was known that none of them would be around for the new administration and they felt quite strongly that they didn't want to be picking the new chief when none of the four would be around. Knowing that the chair was leaving, Chair Dale, he wouldn't be around either. So there was a sentiment that why on earth would five people that are going out the door decide who the new chief that issue number one. Issue number two, it was only last Friday that the two and final citizen appointees were finally presented to us by the province of Ontario. And in fairness to Mayor Brown and in fairness to Mayor Crombie and I, when we were the three sole members, we just did not think it was right in terms of transparency, openness, inclusiveness, that three politicians would make that decision. So we deliberately made a decision to say, let's get the whole board on board and then we can make the decision together. And we are now constituted. And so I can report that, you know, I hope some of you enjoy your July. Uh, Mayors Brown and I and, uh, and Chair I and, and Mayor Crombie will be spending July interviewing folks along with my board colleagues in the hope that by the end of July and early August, we will have had all of the interview process and we can bring a new chief to the region of Peel. So I promised I would update. That is the rationale. Sorry it's taken this long, but with good reason and with the best of intentions. Okay, if there is no other business before the chair, that brings me on to the bylaws. Madam Clerk. The first bylaw moved by Councillors McFadden, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, that the bylaws listed on July 27, 2019, Regional Council agenda being bylaws 42, 2019 and 43, 2019, to be given the required numbers of readings taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal affixed thereto. All those in favour, that is carried. 
This one is moved by Councilor Madero, seconded by Councilor Pileschi, that the bylaw 44 2019 to confirm the proceedings of regional council at its meeting held on June 27, 2019, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the regional appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required number of reading, taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the regional clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. All those in favor, that is carried. Motion to adjourn from Councilor Sinclair and Councilor Santos. Carried, and thank you all right beyond 1230. Have a great day, all. Uh, heads up as you're making your way, our final formal agenda before the summer break is a rather lengthy one, and I just give you the heads up that it could be a fulsome day two weeks hence. Thank you.